Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, welcome to the webinar on BIN in tunneling. I'm ex extremely pleased to be able to welcome you in such a large number of participants to today's webinar on behalf of the European Underground and Tunnel Forum, UTF, and the DAUP, the German Tunneling Committee. Up to 1,300 registrations from 50 countries showed the great interest in the topic of BIM in tunneling. Digitalization is currently spreading rapid, rapidly in many areas of the economy. From my point of view, digitalization and BIM in tunneling, tunneling is a very positive development and that brings with it some changes in the way we work together. In order to drive this development forward, we have to go new ways and regulate responsibilities and interfaces and develop new contract models. Digitalization also brings it uh, more open with it, a more open, faster exchange of know-how. This opens great opportunities and takes the tunneling projects a big step further. Therefore, DAUB, the German Tunneling Committee, took the initiative and prepared a recommendation on digital design, building and operation of underground structures called the BIM in Tunneling. This document has been published in 2019 and has been amended by additional model requirements published in 2020. The work was supported by the Austrian and the Swiss Partner Association. The work of DAUB is of great interest for the EUTF. It forms the platform to initiate a European cooperation with the aim of defining a common standard for Europe. As chair of the Europe European Underground and Tunnel Forum, UTF, I would like to take the opportunity to briefly introduce UTF. On the map here, you can see that UTF extends across Central Europe. Only Luxembourg forms a small white spot. The member nations of the UTF are Austria, Belgium, France, Germany, Italy, the Netherlands, Portugal, Spain, and Switzerland. The founding members have decided that a maximum of 10 countries will be admitted to the forum in the first two years. The forum will then uh, uh, certainly be more open. In October the 17th, uh, 2019, the forum was founded in Lisbon. In the picture, you can also see some young members who have supported the UTF from the beginning. With the integration of the younger generation, UTF is building on the future. The nine cent central European tunneling associations represents about 3,600 individual members, 860 young members, and seven 125 corporate members. A lot of tunneling know-how comes together and we want to use that power to reach our aims and goals. Now I show you what the goals are. The first goal is strengthen the interest of the European tunnel, tunnel community within the ITA and beyond. A second goal is the positioning and influence with respect to European standardization organizations. And the third goal, the goal what we are discussing also today, is supporting the member nations in developing BIM guidelines. The member nations support the guidelines that have been developed and make them known in their countries. UTF promotes also then these guidelines within the ITA. And the la last, the new goal is the support of the development of strategies for the future challenges in the area of protective maintenance and refurbishment for the life cycle of underground infrastructure structures. I hope now you have a better understanding what the UTF, the European Underground and Tun Tunnel Forum is and what the goals are. 
Now it's the time to start the presentations of the webinar. And I will hand over the floor to Lars Babanderde for session one, Fundamentals, Planning and Design. Lars Babanderde is a mechanical engineer and works for more than 30 years within the tunneling industry. He started out as a helper and apprentice with contractors and manufacturers on tunnel guidance systems and machine manufacturers. After the degree, he founded with his father an engineering and consultancy company with the core business in mechanized tunneling and underground structures. A large part of the company became the production of specialized software for tunneling monitoring. Lars Babanderde is currently vice president within the ITA and member of the Daub and Stuva. Lars, I leave the floor to you. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you. Uh, a very welcome uh, as well from my side. I, as, as you heard, I will be the session chair here for the first session. The title of the session is Fundamentals, Planning and Design. We will listen to three lectures. Each of the lecture will be 25 minutes long and the, each lecture will be followed by a five minute question and answer uh, session. That is a quick session just for direct questions to the topic. If the, uh, you, there will be as well a, a discussion round which will be following after the last uh, section that will go on for a longer part and there you have the option as well to um, send us more questions uh, for this section. Um, you are listening or you are viewing through YouTube. You have there the chat function. Please send your um, questions or comments through the, this chat function. Roland Leuker will read those and, and uh, chats and then will collect these and, and tries to group them. And then he will read them out loud so uh, the lecturers then can explain their view on that and give you answers. With that, I hope um, we have done the organizational part and now we would be like to come to our first presentation. The first presentation is uh, named Digital Design Building and Operation of Underground Structures, General Constraints. It will be held by Heinz Erba. Heinz Erba is a um, has a Master of Science in Civil Engineering. He is the Chairman of the Steering Committee on the BIM activities in the Daub. So whoever follows here this closely, he knows his name already. Executive in residence at the ETH Zurich, that is a university there for construction management and for underground constructions and management of major infrastructure projects. He's as well chairman of his own consultancy company and has been before in leading positions at the German railway or, an, no, not or, so, and as well the chief construction officer of the famous Goddard Base Tunnel for the railways. Heinz, please, the microphone is yours. Thank you, Lars, for the introduction. I will give you an introduction presentation on the work of the DAUB, uh, especially based on the work we, present, we presented in May 2019, uh, especially on these recommendations. And uh, the DAUB has developed, I think, uh, quite a clear vision about uh, BIM in underground work. But before we start uh, with uh, our vision, we have to be aware that our infrastructure projects and mainly the underground projects, they are not an entity in itself. We don't build uh, castles only for us. We build the infrastructure for the society uh, and they have to ful fulfill a large set of requirements in a very complex environment. And uh, it's quite clear that in such an environment, uh, digitalization is a very helpful tool. And I would like to show you this uh, quickly. 
as we all know, uh, our projects have to, feel, to fulfill the famous uh, triangle of project management regarding the quality. They have to be on time and uh, we expect that we can create them uh, within the costs or at minimum costs. But we have also to be aware that our projects, and this is, that this is a very special or very important uh, for the underground projects, they are embedded in a factual environment, which we try to deal with our methods, with uh, risk management as we deal or treat the quality with quality management, time with schedule and cost with cost management. But we have, don't have only our factual environment, we have also our social environment. Uh, as we all know from many projects, we have uh, the society, we have politics, we have a lot of interest to deal with and we try to, uh, to, to do our work by using the stakeholder management. And that we can do this, we, it, uh, we need a lot of decisions during our work, beginning already at the earliest uh, planning stage, but later on also in the design, detailed design, and especially in the construction work, uh, during the construction work. And um, we can take decisions based on the workflow shown here in this, uh, also I think well-known pyramid uh, of the knowledge. In the digital world, we have a lot of characters uh, by measuring uh, certain things. These all the sources we have, they bring us not, nothing else than one and zero. And we have to create the data. And from the data, we need information. And the information we have to coordinate and to bring in the context that we create know-how. And finally, only based on the know-how, we can take uh, actions and decisions. I think that's uh, rather important also for the future presentations as that we know um, on which level we are talking about. So I will show you this pyramid later on once more. And the actual uh, decision-making process, as we all know, on, based on paperwork, we have a lot of papers and not everybody has the same version. We draw with the whiteboards, finally we take a photo and um, yeah, it's rather complicated and uh, we all know that it's not uh, very sure that we all are on the same level of information. Therefore, we think that the digitalization uh, helps us quite a lot with the tools of the digital world, that uh, we have the knowledge on our project anywhere and anytime and, of, uh, and for everybody on the same level so that we can make our decisions faster on a, and on a better level than with a classic system. That's our motivation. Uh, I think uh, most of you or everybody will agree with this. So what are the objectives um, when we are using our digital methods? I think it's very important and Taub uh, said also, we will not only talk about the design phase, for us, it's important that we have always the entire life cycle of our projects in mind, starting with the initiation, the design, pro the design, then the procurement, construction, use, and end of life. So end of life is not the most important topic for us. We are working mainly in these earlier phases, but in the next future, we try also to find partners uh, to talk about these aspects of the use of our underground uh, construction. And the goal we want to achieve with our work is to create a continuous lossless and machine readable data flow. And not only during one day on for the entire life cycle. So that's quite a high, challenging goal if we are looking how fast the techniques is um, uh, makes the steps forward but that's the general goal we have and if you have a look on the actual situation in uh, our digital world i think we have a lot of excellent tools we have tools for 3d gaunt modeling we have excellent uh, system system for chist uh, uh, gis uh, integration, uh, certain uh, uh, excellent techniques, uh, also coming from gaming industry for di digital twin of all trades. So we can do a lot of work, but uh, 
for the moment, uh, we think uh, these uh, are all pieces of a puzzle and uh, we have to bring them together. And that's uh, what we try to do with the work of the DAO, that we try or we would like to, to define guidelines and um, recommendations that the future digital world is working together in all aspects because we have so many topics uh, to deal with that we have a, a coherent overall picture. That's uh, the goal of our work. Uh, it's not only a technical uh, problem. I think we have also to take about to talk about uh, processes. And this um, picture on the left hand side, uh, this comes from the German uh, Stufenplan on BIM, the, the general roadmap on the implementation of BIM in infrastructure world, world in, for infrastructure work in uh, Germany. We have the, the famous well-known HOIA phases with the initiation and the design, early design phase with the feasibility study, later on the more detailed design then the design for the execution, the tendering phase, the procurement, and later on the construction. And in this process, we have a lot of uh, exchange of information with partners, especially if the owner is looking for new partners for the design from each phase to the other one, then we have uh, to hand over the information from one designer to the next one. We have to hand it over to the to the uh, contract, we have to hand it over to the authorities which have to give the uh, permit for construction. So these are the famous data drops and uh, we were discussing in the steering committee whether we have already the possibility to work with this uh, um, uh, data drops and we agreed that we have not solved this problem, not for not for one. In certain, we are near, we are closer as long as it is the exchange of data among the designers. But uh, if we have third parties, it becomes rather complicated. So uh, there are in many countries initiatives that we reduce the complexity of the system by the partnering models that we say the early design in the underground infrastructure has to be done by the client. But later on, the, the contractor should be involved earlier as today in the project that we have his knowledge in within the project and we can redu reduce the complexity of the entire system. We will uh, create uh, by far less data drops as we had before so that we have a by far more efficient system. So we think and you can read this also in our first recommendation that we think the digitalization has to go very close with the next steps also in the development of the partnering models of the contract models uh, between the owner and the contract. So what are our big challenges? Uh, I think it's nothing new that we know that we have uh, generally in underground construction, very high complexity. The drawing of the left, from the left side, this is a hydropower plant, um, in Switzerland, the quite new one, and uh, there you see how complex the, the underground geometry is in general, but also in detail. If you have a look on the on such an underground powerhouse, so it's a, such a complex structure uh, which you have to coordinate. But we all also know that our main construction material is the ground in underground construction, not only the anchor and steel and the concrete; it's the ground. And as we all know, the ground has its uncertainties. We can uh, create a, talk, a lot of uh, borehole logs and uh, the, with the seismic systems and everything, but we will never be available to, uh, to avoid the uncertainties uh, at 100%. And I think it's very important that we know this because with the digital model, models, we should not uh, create um, uh, 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 a certainty or a level of certainty which we can not achieve. We have also to, de to show the uncertainties of our models. That's a quite a challenging uh, uh, task for our work. But um, if we are 
thinking how we create our underground modules, then we have already today so many techniques available that if we fill all the data in our models, then we will create an explosion of uh, data. And I think it's very important that we filter out the relevant data and that we avoid the data overload. And this can be done only when we uh, create certain rules. When we need uh, company standards in many companies, uh, as uh, also the big infrastructure operators, they have their own standards, how to filter out from uh, certain data information available uh, or needed for the operation of their si systems, for instance. But we need also uh, national rules. We have our national standards and the digitalization will not avoid the use of the national standards. But we need also international standards because many tasks don't stop at our borders and we need international standards that we can communicate uh, with uh, suppliers and everybody involved in this um, system. And what Taub is doing, we are working on this level. We are creating national recommendations. All our uh, documents we are producing are not standards or laws. We give uh, uh, recommendations on best practice or what we hope will be a best practice in the near future. So that's uh, our work, what we are doing. And the uh, role of Taub and the partner organizations, IT, IK Austria and uh, the Swiss Donneling Society is that we say, we, and also together with uh, the nations from the UETF, uh, we think that we have to take a leading role in developing solutions for the digitalization of the underground construction. We shouldn't leave this to, to organizations where architects or the building construction is leading because I think nobody understands the difficulty of the, uh, the interaction of ground and civil structure better than we as the underground uh, uh, construction in engineers and uh, also dealing with uncertainty, that's the daily business. So we should take this uh, leading role and uh, show our um, solutions. What's our strategy? If we say we want to do this role and we want to achieve this, um, this uh, data flow, machinery and lossless, this will not be done from today to tomorrow. And we think in about the year 2025, we could be may discuss about uh, such systems and we have to go in certain steps. And in, in Germany, and I think in many countries, it was quite similar. In Germany, we started, uh, so really in 2015, there was also this uh, uh, master plan from the federal, uh, from the Office of Ministry of Transport with the goal to, uh, to make the first steps until end of 2020, developing processes and first guidelines, what we did with the first publication end or, or in May 2019, and also with uh, piloting beam for design and for certain construction use cases. But now we have to do more. We have to um, bring all together the entire supply chain. We have to bring together con the contractors, the design companies, the owners, and the future uh, uh, operators. That's a major task which you have to do now until 2025 with the final goal, finally having a data-based holistic uh, digital solution also for the future operation. And uh, we think that this is a very important uh, period now from now in the next few years and this is the motivation why we are working quite hard and with very many uh, very enthusiastic people in this working group. And finally we, we increase the uh, degree of teacher digitalization but also the transformation process how we work to, uh, together this will change in the next future. So that's our strategy and um, if you have a strategy, then you have to uh, create also certain um, fields of actions. The first is that we have finally to agree on the strategy, uh, but then very important is that we work uh, together with the 
people who will be affected by these uh, changes and that we create the team-based team collaborations, no silos anymore. But in the, the classic work, we, I think in many fields, we, we know the silos and we suffer under the silos and digitalization is the big, uh, uh, big hope that we can uh, create a working environment without the silence, without the silos. Uh, single truth of uh, single source of truth concept uh, is the is the motto. But then, uh, very important is also that we have uh, clear rules uh, how we organize our data and the information. Uh, this will be shown also today. Uh, how important this, uh, this aspect is, uh, that we can finally create uh, standardized objects and element libraries. Then the processes are also important, uh, that we create the new processes by, uh, based on the digital world. And we need also development of the software. And I think if we show quite clear uh, solutions and the common approach of the underground uh, construction industry and the owners. The software industry for sure will follow us, uh, and, but they will not follow if they don't see the market. And I think the work that we are working together is quite important also for the software industry that they can develop certain um, tools. And finally, we need the application. Then our DAUB recommendation, quite a few words. This was the paper from May 2019, available in English, uh, German, and Spanish in the near future on the web address shown here. And there we made some recommendations. We said it's very urgent that we create the standardization of ground modeling, that we create standard catalogs for components for underground construction. And that we create a hard on software on environment uh, that we can work together. And we had certain additional uh, uh, recommendations, but we are working on the third, first three bullet points uh, for the moment. And as it was already mentioned in October, 2022, we gave uh, a first additional document, uh, Model Requirements Part 1 with object definitions. You find this also in English and German on our web pages. What are our actual activities? I, will, I As I said before, we have to have a look on this um, knowledge pyramid, where are we working? And we think uh, what we are discussing in uh, within the DAUB and uh, with our partnering organizations, we are working in the field of data and information. And the first most uh, one very important task is to show a solution how to handle the data in underground work that they have a certain structure they are mainly unstructured structured and that we can bring it together that we can create information for especially for ground modeling and the second big task we are working on it for element-based tendering. I think these are the most, most important topics for the moment. So that's the way we are working. And in a, I think in the last presentation from uh, Professor Marta Kurmo, you she will explain you all these things. I'm not uh, able to do this, so I leave it to the specialists, the same here. Uh, you will be introduced in this, uh, what we are doing for the moment for the uh, ground modeling, but the task we have to do, we have our well-known classic design with the block models. We have to bring all this information and the, the level of uh, uncertainties, uh, also the question marks we have sometimes here into the world of the digital ground modeling. That's what we have to do. And the last one, uh, it's very important, even if we are talking about the partnering models, it is very important that we have a tool that we ca can calculate the uh, cost and time schedules. So we need clear uh, recommendations, how we can work uh, in element-based tendering or element-based uh, uh, work in underground uh, construction. 
And this is the next important uh, tool we are working on. Or the, uh, not tool, but recommendations. So we don't create tools, but we, we try to define the recommendations. A short outlook, as I showed all these documents, we have the top level document from 2019. We made the first requirement. Uh, this work is on progress for the moment. And uh, it's, um, there is quite a high probability that we get a certain uh, knowledge that we have to make revisions in these uh, two documents also within the uh, next future. So that's all a little bit of work on progress, but I think we have a quite a stable foundation for our uh, entire work. And um, yes, with this, I would like to show you what we are thinking. Uh, we are not uh, talking about uh, BIM only. We are talking really about the digital twin we have to create also for our underground work. On the left hand side, you see a real tunnel, and in the uh, right hand side, you see a, a digital twin tunnel with the uh, ICE from Germany traveling with more or less the same speed. And you see that in the digital uh, twin model, you have all the information you need for the construction, but also for the uh, future operation and as I mentioned before that's our quick uh, or our big goal to create this on, uh, environment for underground work. So with this I come uh, to my end of the presentation. We are working hard. Uh, we uh, are interested in hearing reactions and uh, getting input also from uh, other countries uh, what you are doing. And um, I think uh, if we are doing our job well, we can present the first documents at the occasion of the WTC in Copenhagen next, next year. And let's hope that we don't have to talk via video conferences anymore, that we can meet you there and uh, that we can proceed our those, uh, discussions there in this very interesting and also very challenging field. Okay, with this, thank you very much for your kind attention and I'm open to any questions. Thank you very much, Heinz Eva, for your great presentation. Uh, I guess nobody can hear the applause, which is branding here through. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but uh, yes, um, Hola, do you have any any questions? So, uh, Lars and Heinz, I had a very close look uh, to the chat and I answered uh, some uh, questions already, which were dealing with uh, the question if it is possible to get uh, the PDF files and uh, such things. Uh, but uh, up to now, there were no uh, questions uh, put into the chat. Um, however, if you allow, um, I may ask a question um, which which I, I would be found interesting. Um, you, Heinz, Heinz, you you showed uh, a lot of the work we have done or you have done uh, for the presentation or for the uh, BIM recommendation. Um, so. Maybe in, in some, some part of, of our colleagues, uh, there is some, some uh, thinking that uh, the construction industry and especially tunneling is a little bit behind uh, the, the other in industry uh, parts. Uh, do you know about or can you tell a little about uh, maybe the, the other parts uh, of our industry, for example, uh, rail, because I know you are very close related to this and, and how, how things are going forward in, uh, in, in that industry. Uh, thank you, Roland. I think um, we are not uh far behind uh, other industries. Uh, 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 if you talk to the people, especially in railway, if you are talking about railway, they have a, a quite similar uh, level of working as we have. They may make also certain pilot uh, tests. Uh, I think uh, 10 days ago, uh, Swiss Federal Railway had the first beam project in Basel, excellent work. But as I showed, it's also a patchwork. So the entire solution 
nobody has. Uh, BIM, I think, is very well developed in uh, con construction of hospitals. I think they are a little bit uh, ahead of us. But uh, generally spoken, I think in uh, building construction, they are also not m miles away from us. I think, uh, but it's good that we, we do a good job. We have to work on, th on this. Otherwise, otherwise, we will lose uh, th this race. That's quite clear. Uh, just at this moment, uh, a question uh, has been asked. How do you articulate your job with the BSI IFC tunnel? So could you explain the collaboration with uh, yeah, other, other national uh, institutes and especially um, concerning the IFC standards? So based on our work, we know that we have to uh, create solutions with um, uh, independent, uh, neutral standards. But we do our work um, based on uh, best practice, we think, as we think we should do it, that it works. And we try to find then also pilot projects so, uh, to see whether it works. If we are waiting for IFC standard tunneling, maybe we wait uh, three or five years. I don't know. They are working on it. But uh, I think it's also not necessary because the reduction of the digital trans transfer in six characters, V, I, M, and I, F, C. That's not sufficient. It's by far more the, behind. And that's the, the level we are working. We have to work in excellent beam solutions, respecting also the international standards. But these are not the only challenges. And uh, I think in Germany, we work together with uh, Mr. Frodel. Uh, he's uh, also in Building Smart uh, Germany. So they are, we work together, but as I mentioned, it's not the only goal. Mm -hmm. So another question which uh, came up uh, some seconds ago is, uh, what are the steps of a company operating in the field of geotechnics should take on the path to digitalization? Where to get educated? Which programs are most commonly used? <laughs> oh, I'm not a... Uh software vendor, it's, uh, it's difficult to, to say which uh, software you should use. But there is software available. And I think something we should also create a little bit more is uh, not only working together with uh, Building Smart, maybe we could also have a look sometimes uh, into the field of the mining industry. And in mining industry, there are excellent programs for ground modeling. Uh, I had a, a short intermezzo where a mining engineer created us within one week, uh, uh, excellent model. So I think there is a lot of knowledge and we have to bring it together as I tried to show with my puzzle uh, slide. And uh, we, we have to bring together the best knowledge from all the fields of um, our industry, also neighbor industry into the, the tunnel construction industry. And then we make the steps forwards by far faster. But if uh, somebody wants to know names about software, I can send an email about certain uh, software products. Yeah, th thank you. I think uh, just, just to add uh, a good start is uh, just having a look into the BIM recommendation, which uh, is able freely available for download uh, on the web page. So another question, I think we have uh, some minutes uh, to allow some uh, other question. Um, there is a, the su suggestion is that early contractor involvement is necessary for optimum application of BIM. How to manage this without stifling competition among contractors and also to pay fairly for the expertise of the contractor of the contractors in the early project planning and design. <laughs> yeah, so in Germany, uh, the, the, um, we are working um, also very hard together with the German construction industry for such partnering models, whether it is uh, the, the model early constructor involvement uh, from UK or another one doesn't, uh, it's not so important. It's the early the contractor has to start his work also already in the German 
design phase three. I think that's the challenge. And if you start there with the competition uh, and uh, the, the different uh, uh, groups who are applying for this, uh, for this work, finally you have to pay them for the design work. You can't uh, ask for, uh, for uh, gratis uh, uh, or without paying um, the design work for a certain design in a tendering process. That's something that is rather difficult in Germany to discuss with the Ministry of Finance because they say you it's too expensive. You are not allowed to do this because they don't see the benefit that in the end you create a project uh, that the total cost will be uh, below the, the classical system. And there uh, one has still to work uh, rather hard in Germany. I think in UK it's a little bit better. Or it's better by far better. Okay. I don't know whether I uh, answered the question, but I think it, it's quite clear in the, such a complicated tendering process. Or so maybe later on, uh, Mr. Mayer can explain uh, what they did in UK for HS2. I think in this in such phases, the, the contractors are paid for the services. Yeah, thank you very much. So I think uh, time allows for a last question. Uh, the question is, do you implement the ISO 1965 in uh, 650 in the recommendations? I think we had it also already on the top level document in 2019. We have already mentioned it. And it's quite clear that we, we, that we have to take into account this uh, recommendation. Okay, so... Yeah, thank you, Heinz. That was it for the moment with the questions. However, if you have any further questions that can be put into the chat and uh, before the break, we can ask maybe more questions. Thank you. Okay. Good, then I take over again. Uh, <laughs> I, so thank you very much for, for Heinz Erber. Thank you, Roland, for, for assisting here with the questions. The next paper, the next presentation is called Basics of Building Information Modeling. It will be held by uh, uh, Mr. Stefan Frodel. Mr. Stefan Frodel completed his degree in civil engineering at the university in Aachen. After completing his studies, he started with Zippelin AG in Stuttgart to work in the central head office of tunnel construction department. He has been working uh, with 3D modeling since 2003 and intensively with BIM in the recent years. He was involved in the first DAO publication as well and has since been active in the DAO working groups on the subject of BIM and tunneling. Well, he's one of the major supports there in these groups. In this lecture, he will present the basics of standardization and the work of the DAO working group of BIM and tunneling. Stefan Frodel, the microphone is your thing, please. Thank you for the introduction. <clears throat> um, in my presentation, I will talk about the basic of building information modeling and the status of the work in the DAO working groups. After a short introduction, I will start with some information about standardization and the work of the DAO working in, uh, groups. After that, I talk about the necessary project structures. Next, I will show you the object catalog and object coding of the DAOP. <clears throat> also, I will tell you about the future, future uh, subjects and work for the DAOP working group and end with a summary and outlook. One target in BIM project is to connect process like cost estimation, shuttling, or several information with model or parts of a model. For this, we must link the building elements in separate applications with different information uh, or processes. On the left-hand side, you can see a 3D model of a tunnel with several elements. Each block consists, consists of many separate elements. For each element, 
ex exists, for example, one starting point and end point in the timetable or one position in the cost estimation. To link each element in an effective way, this should be possible automatically. To link a model with cost estimation, scheduling or other processes, the different building elements must be clearly identified. This can be done with an ID or a uh, co code or a match key or something else. For the transfer of, of information between the model and the applications, the attributes and their content must be clearly identified. This definition is uh, usually done in a project specific BIM execution plan, a BAP. In the future, you can see in the picture, you can see all separate elements of one block. And you can see there are very much uh, different elements. And so we have many uh, uh, linking uh, that have to be done. The problem with this is that individual project definitions or company standards are not compatible. Each company and design planner has its own standard. So the models cannot be easily exchanged or hand over. To use a foreign model, there is a lot of effort necessary to adapt the model to the own company standard. That means we have to match or change the I properties and the attributes that, it, that we can use it effectively. To realize BIM in an effective way, we need a solution. The solution is standardization. We must define a uniform project structure and systematic subdivisions. Regardless of different projects, or different authors. Also, the handling and transfer of data and information must be standardized. To get this uh, uniform and generally standard should be developed. And this is the point we are working on. Now the, to the standardization. There are many tasks to get the standardization. Some of the main tasks are to create, uh, to create an object catalog, to get unique names of objects. Second, to define a standardized, standardized project structure or get a standardized object code to define necessary properties and their attributes or to define how to handle models and their information. And also to get the definition of use cases in underground structures. But uh, there are many more uh, tasks to do. That's only the main tasks. To reach the targets and carry out the tasks that DARP Working Group was founded, as Mr. Erbar uh, to, uh, told in his uh, presentation. The Working Group was writing a publication as an extension of the existing DARP recommendation, BIM in Tunneling. The publication of the new part one was in summer 22, because of not all topics could be worked on further parts are planned, as Mr. Elba also uh, show. The first step was the publication <clears throat> of the DAOP recommendation BIM in tunneling in 2019. In 2020, the supplement of the first DAOP recommendation model requirements part one was ready. You can find all recommendations and all related documents on the DAOP website. All documents are viable, are viable for download and use. The object catalog can be downloaded as a native Excel file. So you can use it or if necessary, although you can change it or edit 
some special uh, objects you need for a project. To the project structure. <clears throat> A project structure divides a project into meaningful sections. The structure should be every time the same. This is very important for a systematic uh, coding. On the pictures, you can see a project specific model structure. This is used to link the different objects with the proce process of shuttling and the visualization. So a systematic coding is necessary for automated linking of objects with BIM processes or cost estimation or scheduling. The mean mo model structure is from big to fine. On the left hand side, you can see the structure out of the DAOP recommendation. We have coordination model, then a discipline model, an object group and objects and uh, sub-objects. A coordination model is a model assembled from various discipline models for purpose of design coordination. That's the model you put uh, several models together and you can use it for coordination or to, uh, to look uh, glass detections or something else. The discipline model contains specific information. The discipline model can divide into individual sub-models. That means you, you can have uh, special models, uh, for example, for um, Yes, the, the railway track and the, um, uh, yes, the, uh, and, and uh, sorry, uh, and other models. An object group is a thematic grouping of several objects that's necessary to um, separate or to group some uh, objects that uh, are thematic to uh, comes together. An object is an individual model element containing stored information. And sub-objects represent different parts of the object. Now I will show you the object catalog, the object code and the properties. For several building elements or components, the names were defined by the working group and put together in an object catalog. The catalog contains about 200 objects and about 100 sub-objects. Because of we don't list it only buildings elements, but also equipment, we use the term object. In the object catalog, we use also a structuring. It will shown, <coughs> I will show you in the next slide. Additional to the naming of the objects, for each object, there is a unique alphanumeric abbreviation defined and used as code elements. The usage of the code segments is also shown in the next slide. But note, the defined objects and sub-objects are not automatically the same as the IFC classification. With the objects and its alphanumeric code elements, a unique object code for each element can be defined. The total object code exists of 14 levels or code elements. Each code segment has a fixed number of letters. The code elements are separated by an underline. So, the total code exists every time of 54 alphanumeric letters or 67, 67 letters with the additional underlines. You can see on the uh, head of the uh, slide, the, the code with the different parts. The green code segments describes information of the project as for example, client, author, 
project name and sub project name. You can see for a big um, project as Stuttgart uh, 21, there are many different um, uh, tunnels, for example, tunnel bad Cannstatt, and that we can differ this um, parts or sub, uh, sub project. So we define this um, separate part. The blue code segments gives information about the whole building. For example, is it a tunnel or a shaft? Is it for railway or highway? Is it the tube in the north or the south if there are two tubes? Or is it uh, tunneling or is it a uh, track construction? So the red code segments represent the objects. This can be building elements and equipment. The objects are separated in object groups, objects and sub-objects. The red code segments represents, uh, sorry, the identifier gives the object an identification of their, if there are similar objects as for example, the blocks of the secondary lining. And the last two gray code segments gives information of special position of elements. For example, if it is the top heating or side drift. If one of the code segment has none information, there will be used across the letter. So the code is every time, or has every time the same length and it's everything, uh, every time um, standardized and you can uh, look for one part or the whole segment, uh, the whole code. So in the first part, there are also defined some properties or property sets for some objects. These properties are not complete. They are only some examples for a better understanding. But we need also for, the, uh, for all objects, the properties, and we must standardize the definitions. This will be in one of the next uh, publications and uh, we work on this. So now I will now show you some further uh, subjects we work on. Mr. Erba to uh, told about this uh, in his uh, presentation. So there's a little bit um, the same. But uh, the first thing first <clears throat> we work is the, um, the, um, yeah, the task of, uh, of the geologic, geological modeling. A geological model is for tunneling and underground structures of great importance. To describe the geology in a model, there are also standardized definitions of objects necessary. For this purpose, one working group deals with the description and definition of the subsoil. The working group defines necessary objects and their properties with attributes. On the left side, you can see uh, we have uh, some objects and its uh, properties and the uh, connecting uh, or which property uh, has, uh, or which object has with pro uh, which properties. To realize a element-based tendering or element-based cost estimation, we need also a standardized definition of properties and its att attributes. In the illustration, you can see the dependency of the building with its elements or objects on the left side and the cost estimation at the right side. In between, objects are assigned to positions or service descriptions. There are three possibilities of the relationship between an object and a position of a service description. 
uh, it may be uh, connecting one to one or n to one or one to n. That means I have one object and uh, many uh, positions or I have um, many, um, many objects and only one position. The different system for a service description in the countries Switzerland, Austria and Germany should also be considered. So another working group looks for solutions that are working with different country specific services descriptions. They try to describe and define a necessary mechanism and process. So a very big difficult topic is the handling with the information. There are different project phases in which more or less data is required. There are different use cases in which we need different data. So we need to define the necessary properties and the model granularity of each project phase and for each use case. An additional working group is working at this topic. And uh, you can see we, we create uh, big um, Excel sheets with many objects and many um, <clears throat> um, properties and we look in which phase we need which um, uh, which uh, objects and which um, informations. Next working group looks at the Kent and tolerances and uh, at the modeling. In order to prevent clashes, the tolerances and Kants must be considered in 3D models. This is the only way to create a clash-free model. On the left side, you can see if we uh, model uh, the inner, uh, the secondary shell by block with a straight uh, axis, and we model the other, uh, the, the primary shell um, sweeping uh, at the axis, then we have on the inner side and the outer side some clashes if we don't uh, use any kinds or tolerances. But modeling the geometry with kinds and tolerances means that the quantities in the model are different from the target geometry. This must be considered at the cost estimation. There's a big team behind the working group BIM in tunneling. The team consists of many participants of several areas, clients, planner, contractors, or uh, universities. Compared to the first publication, the number of contributors uh, has increased. Now there are also members from Austria and Swiss uh, in the groups. Uh, only with uh, many people, we can uh, act this many tasks and uh, I, I talked about I talked about. Okay, now I come to a summary and outlook. As a summary can be said that the target mm -hmm. of part one of the DAO recommendation is to create a basic understanding of the model structure. One more target is to get a unique use of it identical naming and objects independent of the author. And the next target is the identification and definition of object information. That means properties and attributes. By now, initial experience with the object code has already been made. The experiences will be included in updates and additions for further doubt recommendation. In the future, there will be published some more parts of DAOP recommendations. Mr. Erbart told, uh, showed this, uh, also this, uh, the same uh, <laughs> parts. Yes, uh, part two will describe the information management. Uh, in part three, there will give an information about geology modeling. The requirements for a model-based tender will be described in part four. And maybe in part five, 
uh, last but not least, we will be um, uh, or make some informations and definitions about the tolerances and counts. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you for your listening. Have you any questions? Thank you, Mr. Stavropol. Uh, a big applause again, <laughs> which I might extend. Uh, yes, and uh, Roland has some questions for you, I guess. Yes, um, so, so uh, we have one uh, questions from uh, one question from Portugal. Which is uh, on, yeah, so to say, on the standardization uh, in tunneling. So the question is, how can you standardize in tunneling adaptation to front face excavation behavior, especially? We have to leave this window open at least contractually and be prepared to adopt BIM models in underground works. Um. Yes, as a, we try to, to define uh, with the objects and object catalogs and uh, standardization of the naming and uh, the objects uh, of the same. The, the code we use is, uh, think, I think it's uh, necessary to address uh, the, the objects and, and we can automatically um, yeah, uh, link some objects with processes. I, I, I don't know if this is the, the answer of the question yeah. enough. Yeah, I, I think the, the, the question is um, in, into the direction that it is uh, difficult uh, to, yeah, to model all in advance and uh, so that you have to have some freedom uh, in, in changing, for example, in an, uh, in underground excavations, which are not done by a machine, but uh, just by conventional tunneling. Yeah, the, the, the difficult is that uh, I think there's no, um, uh, yeah, there are no no exercises in the, in the past. We, we, we are thinking about uh, theor theor uh, theoretical, uh, what we can do or what we, we have, what we must uh, have for information and how the structure can, can be. But if it uh, is um, practical in, in the future, we, must sh we have to show and uh, if we use it and we, we, we make practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, maybe a question which uh, is not in the direct uh, chronicle order, but uh, it fits a little bit uh, to the question before. How can we integrate geotechnical and structural instrumentation for the construction control process? Uh, yeah, it's, a, it's a good good question, but I think we we must try what what can uh, uh, how it can work. So I, I think there's there are no, not many examples uh, who every body has done this yet and uh, I think it's it's uh, our things in the future we can we must try and then look what we we need for this and uh, if the informations we are now define and uh, the, the objects and the, uh, the attributes of they are of, uh, if they are enough or if we need more okay so uh, one other question is, uh, are there model structures and codes also available for immersion, immersion tunnels? Uh, I think it's for every tunnel. So maybe the, the objects are, or maybe there are some objects we, we have not defined now, but uh, we can, uh, this, Objects can be added every time, and uh, if you know it, we can put it in the object catalog in, in the future, and we can um, extend the catalog. But uh, the coding, I think it's you can use for every uh, underground structure. Okay. Uh, so there are a lot of comments uh, saying that uh, both you, Heinz, and uh, 
Stefan did a very excellent and great presentation, but also some uh, additional notes. So one note is the way of standardization described by you is absolutely necessary and cannot be implemented by individual companies or countries in an economically and intentionally binding way. This is exactly the path that the BSI IFC tunnel working group is taking. So that is more a comment, but uh, maybe you want to say something concerning uh, this comment. Um, or maybe you just agree. So yes. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> then, then I will go to the to the next question. So so okay. uh, no problem. So uh, the next question is: I think we have uh, an additional two minutes. Designers and contractors are generally motivated on, on the benefits of standardization, but how do you see the contracting authorities to buy in this process? <laughs> a difficult question, maybe uh, it's, it's uh, con concerning what, what Heinz already said, uh, that uh, like we have in the HOIE or HOAI, in Germany uh, have uh, certain design phases more in, in the latter part of the design process and due to BIM, uh, this has to be um, shifted to the front uh, of, of the uh, process. Yes. Uh, so another question, do you see any drive to implement standardization across public authorities in Europe and mandate them in tunneling projects? projects? So it's about the standardization process in Europe and, and not doing it only in one country, but uh, also in collaboration with uh, other countries and especially with the authorities in these countries. Yes, uh, we tried yet uh, now with uh, in the uh, yes with, with Austria and uh, Switzerland that uh, we we, lo we are looking that we get the system that works in this three countries, but I think yet, yes, it's necessary that it will be uh, with more countries compatible, but uh, we, are, we try to, to get a system that works uh, in, yes, uh, not only in, in uh, national systems, but uh, also in, in international systems. Uh, we, we try to do this um, not special for one, one systematic. Okay, so I think uh, Lars, I will hand back over to you. There are still some questions, but I will save them uh, for the discussion before the break. Great, thank you, Roland. So we come to the last presentation of the first session. Uh, the title is Designing the Eye in BIM. And it will be held by Dr. Tobias Ram. Dr. Tobias Ram has his background in computing and engineering from the University of Bochum with a strong connection to tunneling. He was already involved in the first doubt BIM recommendations in 2019 when he was working for ZBB engineers as head of BIM. He has since moved to the public contractor Degas and contributes his experience in the division digital design and construction. There he is also leading a project to establish an official BIM data dictionary for roads within the Federal Ministry of Transportation. His talk will address the importance of information, level of information or semantics in BIM projects and the need to plan these already in the design phase. Dr. Ram, please, the microphone is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Bamner. Um, also, from my side, um, a warm digital welcome. Um, I think some of the questions that were just asked to Stefan might be addressed a little bit in my talk. I hope I can clarify some, some of the questions. But first of all, I would like to thank Heinz Erber and Stefan Strodel for introducing the BIM team and our work. And I want to take the chance here and say that working with the BIM team is a great pleasure, highly motivating. And uh, what I will be showing today is not only my work, but the work of a lot of people. And I'm just the lucky guy presenting it here today. 
However, uh, presenting in Corona times is a little bit stay, uh, strange and we don't see your reactions and we, we get your uh, questions by YouTube stream. So this is probably our new normal, and um, but also speaking here gives me the chance to address a topic that is really important to me. And from the questions I heard earlier, um, I think some of you are already um, uh, inter interested in this topic. So um, the title of my talk is maybe a little bit confusing and has several meanings. But the point I would like to make here is our project has manifold requirements for data and information acquisition, reporting, analysis. There are often many sources of information that must be included, uh, sensors and uh, process control units from the machines were already addressed or questioned. And therefore it is not unusual for our projects that a significant amount of time is actually used for reporting, for documentation, and also for the search of information and there are researchers that uh, state that uh, this amount for searching the correct information and verified information is, is very high. And if we can reduce this uh, wasted time, actually, we all um, will save a lot of time and therefore a lot of money and we can focus on the project itself. So my point here is um, it is important to understand that we need to design both the engineering of the real world structure and the information of the digital twin. So this can be separated in different phases, such as design phase and construction and operation phase. But um, they both must be addressed, so the real world structure and the digital twin. And within the DAO team, we currently focus on, on design and construction, but this will, uh, the operation phase is very important. So my talk will address the importance of information and the need but also the chance to design this information. So while I know the title of my presentation is maybe a bit confusing, I hope the structure is uh, much more uh, straightforward. First, I will give you a short introduction to my organization so that you understand where we come from and why it is important for us or why it is also important in my opinion. Then I will go into some more detail why uh, the designing the, the eye, the information in BIM uh, within a project is important. And finally, uh, oh, and then I will go into more detail uh, about the, the results, tunneling data dictionary, which also we've already seen a preview by Stefan, uh, the DAO object catalog. And finally, I will try to take a look in the crystal ball and tell you what's coming up next in this specific field. So Degas is a project management company that is specialized in German highways, Autobahn, and federal roadways. We are a public contracting authority. Uh, we manage the project until handover to the operation phase. Our main shareholder is the Federal Republic of Germany and additionally 12 of the 16 federal states. While we manage the project, we take the role of the owner and the landlord and this means we don't actually plan or build the infrastructure ourselves but we contract partners to do this for us and in the last 30 years we were partly uh, we were and partly still are responsible for almost 3000 kilometers uh, of motorways in germany so we've uh, made up our experiences with uh, motorways, but we also made our experiences with the BIM project, or the BIM methodology. Uh, Degas has already started BIM activities in 2014. And meanwhile, we have made, well, we are roughly with uh, 80 BIM projects starting or running. And obviously these projects have different um, levels and aspects of BIM applications uh, spe uh, specifically um, uh, oriented to the goals we are trying to achieve, but I will be speaking about this later in, the, in my talk. As for the map, you, uh, you can see here, uh, sadly, the map is already outdated again. Um, we are um, starting BIM projects uh, pretty much uh, every day. But the message uh, here, I think, is clear. Working with them is possible. 
And we are all well advised if we prepare for the situation that BIM is a standard in our projects. And looking into the audience, uh, several hundred participants, uh, I think uh, lots of, of people already um, prepare for the situation and take this very seriously. So um, this brings me to the motivation. Why is it important to have a plan for the information in your, in your project? Well, I know a lot of people that say BIM is nothing new. We've done 3D modeling already 20 or 30 years ago. So, and this is true. Um, there are applications for 3D modeling that are 20 or 30 years old. And Stefan Frodel is, uh, is one of the pioneers, I guess, and is working since, uh, since the early 2000s with, with 3D. And it's uh, nothing extraordinary. And I also have have people that tell me uh, we don't need no 3D model to successfully manage our project, which is also true. We, or more correctly, some of, of you guys probably, um, we have successfully managed projects in the past without all this fancy stuff. No iPhones, no tablets, no cloud spaces whatsoever. But still, you managed to successfully, uh, or you, you, you successfully managed the project. But as so the questions already asked uh, earlier, today's project, in today's project, we face uh, manifold data, manifold sources of information, and it, it feels like it increases every day. The data of number sources, sensors, scanners, whatever, they, they constantly increase. And thus, the requirements and the time we need every day for documentation and reporting also increases. And some of you might have the impression that we spend more time reporting the project than actually engineering the project. And BIM can really address this issue. BIM methodology aims to support us with information handling. So I guess most of you already um, figured that BIM is more than only 3D modeling. And it can enable us to make knowledge-based decisions in the project. So my statement here is the I in BIM really contributes to your engineering success. And if the project is successful in the engineering domain, it is much more likely that the project will also be a commercial success for all of us. So obviously, there's still aspects that can lead to engineering or commercial issues. But if you free your time from documentation and the search for information, really the search for information, we will have more time and more resources to focus on these aspects and on the project itself. So my statement here is the I, the information is really, really important uh, and we must have a plan for that. Um, so effective information management probably is the uh, is the slogan here and uh, design the digital twin and its construction and not only the real world construction. This is my, my uh, credo here. Um, on the right hand side, you see an idealized chart that expresses basically that the knowledge of the project, so say its construction and design requirements increase over time. But as we move uh, through the project, the phases of the project, so design, approval, tendering, construction, operation, and so on, we regularly lose a certain part of this knowledge and it must be recreated with additional resources and effort. So obviously some of this information can be lost without any trouble. For instance, it's not necessary to have all the details of the alternative al uh, alignment going left or right when only one specific alignment is realized. Therefore, we should really identify what information, which information can be lost and which information is needed later on in the project. Thus, an uh, effective information management requires the specification of projected use cases in this very stage and maybe in later stages and also the requirements. So anticipating use cases in later stages, uh, or especially when changing these phases, challenging, obviously, but um, it is necessary and it's really beneficial. And so therefore, and probably we won't address all of the topics, but 
Um, reducing this loss will um, help a lot, in my opinion. So there are methods like information delivery manual, model view definitions, and so on, to establish such information management, but this will not be the topic of my talk. And um, maybe you already uh, applied a different approach, and um, I just uh, encourage you to look into these, these methods. Um, but typically, if you want to do this, uh, you um, have to define also use cases, actors, deliverables, uh, guidelines, and so on. And once this is clear, we have a setting to construct and optimize the project in the digital world first, and then realize it very efficiently in the real world. Now, I know that the slogan sounds great, and we've already heard uh, tendering and contracting issues, and there are some uh, issues that, that hamper this approach or make it difficult. In Germany, we have these, these tendering and contract regulations that must be met, and these regulations are sometimes not yet adjusted to BIM. But this must be addressed and respected. But nonetheless, taking a, a BIM point of view, this slogan uh, is really, really promising. Even if you're not quite there yet, this is also true. We are not quite there yet. So I want to give you a short introduction to the, to the workflow <clears throat> that we at Degas use to, to specify our information requirements within projects. So here you see the, the general workflow to develop a, the so-called employee in information requirements. Um, first, we define the goals of the project. Um, obviously, the three main goals, budget time and quality, they always apply. But often, we def or, or, or uh, typically, we define additional goals such as transpar transparency of construction sequence or support for the stakeholder management. For example, residents that are involved in, in this uh, project and so on. You can think of other goals that you want to achieve with the application of BIM. And once uh, we have a clear idea of these goals, we um, derive use cases that support these, these goals. And I will be speaking about use cases um, in the next slide. And once you define the use cases, um, we can derive from this uh, information and quality requirements and data formats, a level of information needs, such as uh, geometry and semantic needs, uh, documentation, the use of a uh, common data environment, and workflows in this common data environment and so on. And finally, we'll move on to, to modeling guidelines, coordinate, coordination systems, and so on. So, on. <clears throat> so here um, is a list of use cases for design and uh, approval phase. You can find the list in uh, and some details in the uh, DAOP uh, publications already uh, mentioned several times. Uh, um, so I encourage you to go there and have a, a look into this publication for uh, more detail. And also for explanation of the, of the list. And in the screenshot, you see the coordination model of a major project in, in Berlin. Uh, depicted here is uh, you see the boreholes for the ground investigation. And to my knowledge, the ground model is now finished uh, with the levels and, and there's also information integrated where we must be careful because of the bombs from the Second World War, for example. I don't know the, the, the English translation, so please excuse that. But um, additionally, in this project, our colleagues also projected a, a rather interesting use case, in my opinion. Uh, the use case uh, analysis of noise and air pollution, where the simulation of, of noise and air pollution was done in a rather traditional manner. And the contractor worked in a very familiar setup. Um, but then the results of his analysis were moved into the 3D model. And we can now give much more detailed and transparent answers to the resident uh, questions such as what kind of emissions sound emissions will be at my window when you realize this project. And we can also um, use this to, to argue what kind of countermeasures are necessary or are effective and um, will reduce these emissions. So this is very, very uh, interesting tool. And 
the list of use cases is uh, probably not uh, not finished yet, and there you can think of other use cases. But to wrap it up, um, our understanding is define the goals you want to achieve with your, within your project, and then you can derive the use cases, and then you can derive uh, other aspects of your project. So uh, as already mentioned earlier, um, you derive these use cases, and then you get an idea what kind of discipline models you will need for your project. And you will also get a clear or clearer understanding of the requirements of these discipline models. So in the slide, you see the idea that several federate discipline models are combined into a single coordination model. And for us at Degas, it is utterly important that the coordination model is within our CDE, our uh, common data environment, as a single source of truth. And thus, we are very sure or we are confident that the information we find in there, in this model, is valid and up to date. And this is an example of uh, possible discipline models. I will not go into, into much detail, but um, depending on your project, on your use cases and your goals, you will have more or less or different uh, use uh, discipline models that must be applied to your project. And especially with long structures, we divide them all, as uh, stated by Stefan already, um, into sub-models. Um, to circumvent the issues with, le uh, with very long 3D uh, structures. So, but then again, maybe you ask yourself how, do, how to ensure an effective information management with federate discipline models and several independent and or dependent use cases. So my, my statement is design the I in BIM ask questions. What questions need to be answered in your project? Are, there, uh, are these questions the same throughout the project or do they, do they change? What, what actors must be involved? What roles do these actors have? What information or what model do these actors provide or require? This is a different approach. And this is a key aspect of BIM management in my point of view, and you will probably find it very difficult to really thoroughly describe a process and its condition and requirements, even if you execute this process almost every day for maybe the last five years. It is very difficult and tiresome. And you need to identify a person that uh, supports this process and has the knowledge for this process. But it also gives you the chance to critically redesign the process so that you have a lean and efficient but effective project execution. So my advice here is take the chance and design the I in BIM. So to give you a short um, glance at the results that we in DAO uh, BIM team uh, developed, the tunneling uh, data dictionary, um, we know it's not, not finished yet, it's not complete, we are, but we are also confident that it is a huge step into the right direction. So. Um, You've already seen this uh, to, to some, some uh, extent. Uh, we created a uh, data dictionary that um, divides into 14 levels or 14 properties, more or less, with uh, roughly 200 objects and sub-objects. You can combine them into a um, string of abbreviations and identify each model element uh, directly. Um, but you can also come up with a different solution, and we will be talking about uh, later on how to combine them. So this is our approach, and we are very confident that this is a, a good step into the right direction. And I really encourage you to, to um, take this approach and maybe use it in your project and give us feedback um, to what is working well and what is working maybe not so well, where you have uh, additional requirements. So here I'm going to show you an um, application of the DAO object catalog. Uh, you see here um, a model from a railway project. So this is not, not our project, but it was provi provided by my dear colleague Wolfgang Fensloff from Implenia. Thank you. And they um, 
took the model and applied the DAO um, object catalog. You see here the 14 properties within a um, BIM software. And what you also see is that there can be parallel application of a separate object catalog. For instance, here, um, the, contra uh, the company has its own definition of information that they need to execute the project. And they can be, they can coexist into your, uh, within your model without any problem. However, we as a contracting authority, we specify in our empl uh, employees information requirement what kind of properties we want in the model and what we are using in the model, for instance, the DAO uh, properties. And these properties must be in the model. And anything that is additionally there can be added, but it is subject to discussion um, inside the project if we need it, if we want it, or if, it's, uh, if it must be removed before you hand over the model. Um, but um, as, we, as I said already, um, this is uh, subject to discussion because um, it doesn't always address all of the, the information that we need. So from my point of view, there is no need for only one data co uh, catalog and the companies can work with their own if they already have it. And if they don't have it, they can use uh, a stop uh, object catalog. So this brings me uh, already to the uh, last uh, stage of my, my, my talk. I uh, will take a look into the crystal ball, but before that, I'm going to make a short summary. So 3D modeling is not necessary for your engineering success, but truth be told, it sometimes helps. The eye, the information supports engineering success and allows us to make a knowledge-based decision-making and reducing the information loss you must anticipate also what kind of use cases are um, implemented in later stages of the project. And DAO provides a tunneling data dictionary um, that we are very happy with, and, um, but we are aware that it's not, not finished yet. And we are working currently on properties and property sets in relation to defined use cases and obviously to um, defined objects. DAOP is also um, working on phases of information maturity uh, for tunneling, such as uh, geometry and um, information or LOG, LOI stages. Um, the DAO object catalog will be moved from Axel to a database, <clears throat> database solution, and we are also working on the concept of interconnected data dictionary. So the idea is depicted here. Um, we have um, certain clouds. These clouds represent uh, servers. And um, we provide our data dictionary in such a solution, uh, building smart uh, data dictionary is a different solution, no, not a different, but an additional solution. And you can apply, uh, you can go to these platforms, you can go to these solutions and uh, use these data dictionaries. However, uh, depicting islands is not so nice and they are independent and um, we are, I already said, we are working on the interconnection of these clouds and um, this connection is based on several ISO standards and also the IFT format. And if you're interested in more details, I have very good news for you. My dear colleague, uh, Alexandra Masakuma will be talking about this topic later on. And with this outlook, uh, I want to close my talk and thank you for your uh, attention and um, open for questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Ram. Wonderful. I as well forward the applause, which I can nearly hear already. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And um, yeah, Roland, do you have any questions? Yeah, the first question is just popping up. Um, so the question is, how do you define which information and depth of information you need in which project phase? Do you have a standardized, a standardized approach? Um, yes and no. Um, depends on the use case. Um, we have a lot of in experience with certain use cases and we uh, know what and of information is used in this in, uh, or required in this use case. And typically we, we can manage these um, rather good, but truth be told, uh, we are 
on the way of uh, exploring all the dimensions of the use cases and all of the use cases. And um, for others, we we um, have to rely on the discussion with our partners within the project. And we make a, a partnering approach and say, okay, what is your suggestion? And then we discuss it and then we find a solution. And once we've tried that uh, one, two, three, how many times, we get an idea what uh, what what is necessary and what is maybe overload. Yeah, maybe um, I I can add a question uh, for myself. Uh, so you told about that there are already a lot of information is available. Um, how how complicated is it uh, to include it because i i can imagine that uh, every institution has it all, its own standards uh, for example if, if i think about uh, water supply lines and and canals and uh, all, also other information so how how much effort does it take uh, to to have this connection uh, established um This is a very good question and uh, really deep into the crystal ball. I, I think it also depends on the on the standards or the, the regulations. There are standards that um, already feature uh, object oriented um, descriptions and this makes it much more easier. Um, other regulations are are more designed for uh, the implement uh, the, 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 the interpretation of the engineer and so the it is not clearly stated uh, do this do that do this but um, the the knowledge is uh, between the lines how, how, like you say uh, in germany and uh, you have to interpret these information and this is um, rather difficult because computer uh, and um, uh, information technology is rather straightforward here and can't really take this interpretation this must be done by engineers um so it really depends obviously yeah just uh, popping up uh, a question more or less related uh, to, to the one before um so it is uh, how do you estimate the effort uh, required to comprehensive modeling in bim on the part of the contractor and uh, especially uh, do you compensate this effort separately um well for compensation i'm probably the wrong guy uh, answering here because my background is much more in computing but um, to my knowledge um, again it uh, it depends we have certain uh leistungen um, we have certain things that that are usually done within the project with or without them and um, we try to separate what is additionally um, between uh, what, what comes additionally um, through the, the, the BIM methodology and then it, uh, it, it really varies uh, from, uh, from project to project uh, and also from uh, who is our partner um, because some have a lot of experience and uh, there is no, 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 not, not so much effort anymore. And in other projects, it is different. No? It really, uh, it really depends. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Um, another question is uh, a little bit related to the operational phase of the project. So uh, his question is related about how could you manage the information coming from the deformation of the tunnel during the lifetime of the infrastructure? Any workflow already created concerning this? Uh, so I'm not. I'm not sure if there's a, a, a workflow already created that is uh, implemented into um, the operation phase and in, in the authority. But um, from a conceptual point of view, it's um, you have to separate probably. In are you updating the geometry of the model, which is kind of difficult, and um, also maybe not not necessary if you're not using it or if you're measuring the the deformation um, and store this information as a alphanumeric value within your model this is much easier to to bring into existing structures 
and it also allows you to to make um, progress charts and uh, estimations and such things with data analyzer tools. So um, it really probably depends on what you're doing with uh, the idea um, of integrating that into into your BIM model. And um, I know that uh, there are works, and but I, I'm not really sure um, how how far progress these works are to actually um, automatically update a 3D model with sensor-based information from varying uh, sources. Uh, so this could be deformation or whatever uh, other sensor you are you are using, and not only during operation phase, but also during construction phase while you're driving. Um, there's also a lot of deformation um, and uh, yeah, movement um, on the surface probably, or not a lot, but uh, there is movement maybe. And you can uh, try and uh, bring this into your model. And I know that there are approaches already. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. So these are the questions concerning this last presentation. And I would hand over again back to Lars. All right. Thanks, Roland. Well, we still have nearly a quarter of an hour time, and uh, we would like to open with that now the discussion round. There are a couple of points we would um, like to raise and then see the opinion. Um, I, let's say we want to proceed the way um, we have a couple of points. Number one, I will read the, the discussion point and, and, and ask um, here one of our lecturers uh, or the lecturers to give their opinion. The first point would be the risk can be there for excessive simplification because of absent standard solutions. The similar risk is not there for only linear, simple, and standard, instead of detailed, targeted ones. And that was Heinz who wanted to address this topic. I will try to give an answer. Yes. Also to the to maybe to the last question. If we start standardization in the underground work. And the result is that we can ha handle only uh, simple projects. I think then we didn't do the right job. Standardization has to uh, allow that we deal with the complex geometry and also with uh, the complex ground conditions, as we all know. That's very important. And uh, it's quite challenging. It's quite clear that we start with the things uh, of uh, a little bit uh, simpler task, but uh, later on, the, uh, our recommendations have to um, fulfill the requirements of all kinds of projects. Behind me, you see this uh, tunneling section of the squeezing rock zone in the Gotthard Base Tunnel. And uh, if I think at the last discussion before we start this, ses this discussion session here, it's quite clear that in this zone where we had uh, radial deformations of about 80 centimeters during the construction phase, our digital models have to follow these, uh, these uh, deformations also. We can't say what we could manage with the classic system, we can't do it anymore with digital systems. I think that's quite clear that we have uh, to work hard on it, but we work now, Mr. Frodo, since one year or less than one year, I think, so it's quite clear that we don't have solved all these problems, but the goal is to have solutions on all these aspects. Maybe in this uh, uh, fourth uh, additional document about um, the toler tolerances and such things, but we have to, to find solutions on all these tasks. So I think standardization can't be a risk that we get two simple models. Okay. Anyone else would like to add to this to Heinz Erba? Nope. Okay. Um, 
the second point uh, which was listed, Roland, uh, I, frankly, maybe you have to read it because uh, he typed it into the round here. And I, I frankly don't understand, not really understand the, that point. Maybe you have there more information, background information than I do have here. I'm not, not really, but uh, as I understand it, it's uh, directed to the naming of objects and uh, probably if the objects are named the same, uh, that there might be some confusion in the main model concerning the objects of each sub objects. So I think uh, yeah. at least as I interpret it, it's, it's uh, essential that, that you have a unique naming in, in the model. Maybe somebody can. Yeah, maybe I can uh, take this question. So uh, yes, having uh, different meanings for uh, the same thing is, is a problem. Um, but if you always um, have uh, are looking for one um, specific um, attribute property, the meaning shouldn't be different. And um, my, the, 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 the point here, or the statement here is that it can be or it, it is possible from a modeling point of view that you have one object and you have a property that says orientation is south, um, which comes from the DAO. And then you have another property that has a different uh, naming that also says orientation is south. For example, in the, um, the example I made or Implenia made, uh, the Implenia workflow maybe is um, directly linked to the specific naming of the object and they use it for cost calculation, time estimation and whatever. And we as the contracting authority, we, are, we don't have, we, we don't see the need to uh, go to any, to all of the contractors and say, you have to name it like this and this and this, and then you will be able to work with us. Because um, from a point of view, it is, from, our, from my point of view, it is possible for the company to have um, information within the model that they need and require with, for their project. And me, for example, I don't need this information. And then it is possible to um, erase this information once they hand it over to us and bring, um, for example, the DAOP catalog in there. So it is true, you should absolutely avoid um, confusing and uh, yeah, different meaning, uh, different classification. But then again, it is possible to use different um, properties to describe something for our world and to describe something for the, the processes of the, the contractor or the, the design company or whoever is involved. And um, this, this gives you the freedom to implement your process. And uh, so we don't need to, to, to standardize all of the company's processes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, there's a third point. Do you think that the language is a burden for achieving the required degree of standardization? Could English as the BIM language also in German speaking countries accelerate the process and the exchange of lessons learned? I uh, saw Heinz wanted to answer to uh, that. I think as a member of the DAO, I would like to say a few words about this. I think uh, we were working together in the German speaking countries uh, because we said we have to make a, a test and we want to integrate uh, the Swiss and the German codes as a pilot, whether it works among different countries. And I think we make, we have a, quite a good speed, I think. Uh, so I think it's not uh, the question whether English would um, speed up our progress. But uh, what we want to do is that uh, this, uh, our documents will be used in the, also in other countries. Therefore, we translate them to English always. I think a few weeks after the German version, we have the English version also available. 
and we are very happy that our Spanish colleagues uh, already translated the first um, document into Spanish. But this means not that uh, uh, non-German -sp speaking countries shouldn't um, enter into this process. I think uh, if, we, if the other countries see this is a very good uh, basis of what we showed today, I think uh, the support from other countries and uh, know-how and the experiences is very welcome for our work. And uh, this is and later on a, a topic, I think, of UETF, how to organize uh, all these things. Uh, and I kindly invite you, if you have contribu contributions or requirements from your countries that we should consider, please send it to us. And uh, the best what can happen to us that we create a, really a European standard for tunneling. And there, I think we are open. It's not a question of uh, the, the language. Perfect. Thank you. There's one. We are three minutes uh, still with time. And then there's one more question, which Stefan. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, uh, uh, maybe I can follow up. There is one more question about the UTF, yes. on, on, and uh, this is close to what uh, what Heinz uh, said. Uh, Switzerland and Austria is in the steering committee of these uh, DAUP uh, guidelines, and we discussed also how we we enlarge this later on on the other countries uh, within the EUTF and. In the March board meeting, I will discuss this with the presidents of these nations. And in my opinion, it's clear some countries, they develop some documents and some not. Uh, some countries are working together and we have really to find a way how we come to a European wide recommendation or standard. Uh, this will be the, the big goal uh, in, in UTF to go this way, like Heinz mentioned, uh, that's maybe not a dream. Uh, it should be really realized that we can talk with uh, uh, classification of the codes and so far and so how we treat it, how we name it uh, in the same matter. Uh, it depends uh, basically also on which level down, on, on the contractual level, uh, which, which down where the national standards and codes uh, from contractual wise um, grabbing in, in all the system. And this interface we have really, really to define that uh, maybe the national uh, uh, standards uh, and contract models uh, are also then uh, really good implemented. But like I, I was uh, telling very short in my opening speech, I don't believe that in 15 or 10 years, we are working in the same contract models like we do now. This, this time is over, ladies and gentlemen. So we have to go then really in, in, in other directions if we are working in projects uh, in this digitalization. Uh, I can't believe that the old contract models fit really in that. So we have in cooperation really to think further and this we can only think really European wide, not only in some nations. Thank you. Thanks. I, uh, I really would like to close this session with, with one more technical, more technical question, which I find quite good. Uh, there's one uh, from one in the audience. Can the BIM models of the geological environment also handle the interactive tunneling methods, LARI TBM, EPB TBM, or variable density TBMs? That is not only the passive excavation support, such as anchors, arches, and shot creep, but as well as also with the corresponding active working phase supports. Giving it a little bit into the TBM area. <laughs> Any opinion here in this round? Yeah. Um, well, maybe I try to answer this this rather specific question, but it's a very interesting question. And um, <laughs> I know I'm repeating myself, but it really depends what you are trying to do with this information. And um, I could think of a uh, way to um, express this information, to visualize this information, and also to, to make it av uh, available within the um, 
deformation or the, the variation over time, um, which is also very interesting, but also difficult. But um, I think for the, this very uh, format we are, we are working here, uh, we, are, we are doing here, this is too much of detail. Maybe you can contact us in, uh, directly and we try to, to discuss this because it's actually really interesting for, for me personally. Yeah. It is uh, more or less comparable to what Heinz Erber was uh, saying before with the ground movements, because at the end you're doing, dealing with the same effects. Heinz. Yeah, uh, I would like to, to add is uh, what I said before. If we create standards where we can handle on, only simple ground conditions and with standard uh, uh, TBMs, uh, with a standard lining, then we don't do uh, the good job. We have to create uh, documents where we can handle all type of uh, tunneling methods and all type of all kind of ground behavior. That's the goal. But uh, I agree that we have still a lot of work to, to, to do. And I think all the input and the question, this helps us to, to go the right way. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. So thank you. We are briefly behind 3 p.m. And so more or less in time. And uh, thank you very much for being part in session number one. We will have now a short break until 25 minutes past three. So in 23 minutes, we would start again with session number two and we would be delighted to have everyone back on board and then to get to the next three presentations which are as interesting as this one here, as these have been. So many thanks for being our audience and see you in a couple of minutes. So, uh, welcome back after the break. I hope everybody can hear me. Yes. Yes, that's okay. So <laughs> we're not the first ones after the break. Yeah, I hope you could strengthen yourself during the break and uh, are now hang hungry really for much more information and I want to really quickly to start up and hand over the floor to Peter Michael Meyer for session two, the implementation and realization uh, of the BIM. Peter Michael Meyer is a civil engineer and a computer scientist who has worked for 30 years in various management positions at Strabag and Zyblin. He's primarily involved uh, in the planning uh, of large infrastructure projects in tunnel construction. Uh, he's committed to the implementation or construction process in software. He managed a software company for 15 years where he was developing the IRIS program for mechanized tunnel construction. He's a member of the DAUB and is involved in the BIM steering committee for the coordination of the activities in the working groups. Mr. Meyer, please, it's your microphone. Thank you, Stefan Mauro, for, for your introduction. Uh, welcome everyone uh, to the second part of our webinar, implementation and real, uh, realization. Uh, we have planned three presentation uh, on topics uh, related to BIM application in this uh, second session. The focus will be uh, on the implementation of BIM in practice. In the first presentation, BIM-based design and tendering, we look at the topic more from the designer's uh, point of view. In the second presentation, uh, multi-dimensional data integration for BIM, uh, we combine uh, the requirements from standardization with practice and in the last presentation, example for application of BIM in a specific project, uh, we focus on the application of BIM in construction projects as well. So um, I think all the three presentations are really great. Uh, and uh, I hope that we, uh, uh, we really get a really interesting uh, part of our webinar now. Uh, maybe first, uh, important for the colleagues who are new in uh, the second part of the webinar, please write questions about the presentation in the chat. Um, these will be asked at the end of the presentation. Just that information uh, 
I think yeah, it's, it's important. So we will start our second session with a presentation by Eric Carrera. Uh, Eric Carrera works currently for the engineering uh, company Lombardi as project manager and deputy leader uh, of a competence center, BIM. He worked in the past years in major tunneling projects in Switzerland and Austria, and he is working currently in the project Second Tube Goddard Road Tower. He is member of a board of the Swiss Tunneling Society Young Members, and Eric lives in Moralto in Switzerland, is married and father of a six month old daughter. Great. Uh, Eric, we are looking forward to your presentation. The microphone is yours. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. You can hear me, right? Yes. Perfect. Thank you very much. Dear colleagues, I welcome you to my presentation, model-based design and tendering in this webinar organized by DAUG and AUTF. First of starting my presentation, I would like to give an overview of the context of my today's presentation. We have seen in the previous presentation that these uh, beam recommendations from DAUP focus on our plans to focus on the entire life cycle of uh, tunnel infrastructure. Currently, more in the pre in the preliminary phases, design, tender, construction, but the goal is to extend it also to the phases commissioning, operation, and maintenance. Some of these uh, possible beam applications or use cases in in the phase operation and maintenance, we, we heard it in, in the first presentation with the use of the digital twin, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. My presentation today will focus on the early project phases where we as designers are involved. So I will, in the first part of the presentation, talk about uh, model based design, and then in the second part of the presentation, talk about how to hand over the model to the next phase or so to the phase tendering implement the, the model with all the tender documentation and then to do the handover to the contractor for uh, starting the construction. To the specific content of my presentation in the first part, as said before, I will focus on the model-based design. In the first step, I will explain the importance of the BIM goals and the BIM use cases, then I will talk about the BIM execution plan, the content of a BIM execution plan, and then we are going to talk about the model-based coordination, quantity takeoff and cost estimation model-based, and in, in, in the last part of, of this first part of the presentation, I will talk about the topic uh, extraction of drawings of the BIM model. In the second part, we will, I will briefly introduce the possibilities of uh, model-based tendering, and the problems that we are facing and the possibilities of the model handover to the contractor to the contractor by start of the construction phase. So let's start with the first part, model-based design. Um, first of all, I want to introduce the concept of BIM goals and BIM use cases. We heard in the, in the second presentation already some topics about this. Um, the important Part of it is that in a first step, the BIM goals and the BIM use cases are defined by the client and described in the document exchange information requirements or employer information requirements. Then in a second step, these BIM goals and BIM use cases, uh, use cases are concretized, are precise, and may be extended by the client together with the designer and described in the BIM execution plan. Sometimes it's difficult to, to imagine what we understand under BIM goals, under BIM use cases. We saw already some, some use cases in, in the second presentation. I just want to give some, some example in, in this slide. One BIM goal that we are facing um, actually in, in a couple of, of projects is the goal of, of the client improvement of the design quality. The relate, possible related BIM use cases could be a, a model-based coordination, so that the coordination between all designers is done via a, a BIM model. 
or another related uh, beam use case to this beam goal could be the model based quantity takeoffs so instead of, of classical uh, quantity takeoffs or, or quantity estimations from 2d drawings in this case we are directly extracting the quantities for example for the cost estimation or for the bill of quantities for from from the beam model Another example of beam goal uh, could be the use of the beam model for the operation and maintenance phase. Um, related beam use cases in this case would be a model-based maintenance. We would, at the end of the construction phase, we would update the beam model to an as-built model, link the maintenance plan um, with this beam model, and then doing the maintenance based on this, uh, on this uh, beam model. Another possible use case related to this beam goal would be the model-based trainings and simulation for, for rescue forces. The implementation would be similar to the use case before. So we have an as-built beam model. This is exported to a virtual reality or augmented reality application, handed over to the rescue forces for their trainings and their simulation and all this before the infrastructure or the tunnel infrastructure is built. Um, to close this slide, I want only to remark the importance of defining clear and precise beam goals and, and beam use cases. We, we have faced uh, beam projects without a clear idea or vision what we have to achieve with this, uh, with this beam project. So uh, our point is that it's important to have clear goals that can al and, and use cases that can also be implemented, as we also see saw in the, in, in, in the second presentation. It's, it's the first step of a, of a model-based design. The next topic that I want to show today is the BIM execution plan. The BIM execution plan is the roadmap for us designers in order to execute the client's requirements in a BIM project. So it's for us designer is the key document in, in a BIM project. A BIM execution plan consists on the, on the following parts, on the definition of the BIM goals of the, and the BIM use cases, they have to be precisely defined in, in this BIM execution plan. In the BIM execution plan, we also define and describe the project related BIM organization um, I will talk about it later. We also define the BIM process plan, so how the, the document or the models are created, how are they approved, how are they then coordinated with the other um, discipline designers. In the BIM execution plan, we also define the information requirements and the model requirements, so which information we have to uh, consider in the model, how, how, how we have to structure the models, we also define in the BIM execution plan the coordination and collaboration rules between all designers and, and with the client. And the last uh, important point is, are the definition of the ICT infrastructure of the, of the project. Now I'm, take, I'm going to take a look more in detail in some of these topics. BIM organization. Um, as in every project, in also in, in, a, in, a, in a BIM project, it's important that we have a clearly defined organization. We are now in a transition phase between classical projects and fully BIM projects. It's, it's like a hybrid phase. And we are dealing in different projects in two types of, of BIM organization. We are, one type is um, the project where the BIM organization is implemented in the normal project organization. So the BIM coordinator, BIM manager are already in the, inside the, the project organization. And in, in smaller BIM pilot projects, we are also seeing a second, a second type of structure where the client decides for the BIM project doing a separate parallel organization. On the right side, in the slide, we see a possible BIM organization for, for a BIM project. This is an example, of course, um, from, a, from a current project. On the top, we have the, the client with the related BIM manager on the side of the client, in this case, um, represented by a third company, but it could be also part of, of, uh, of the client itself. And 
Um, below, we have then the, pro the, the beam coordinator, and in the case of a bigger project, a beam coordinator for each uh, discipline designer, and below the beam coordinator, each uh, beam modeler. So the main beam roles are three. We have the beam manager. The beam manager is responsible on the side of, of the client. He is responsible for the definition of the beam goals. He um, sets up the beam execution plan and defines and coordinates all the beam processes of the project. Then on the side of the designers, we have the beam coordinator. He supports the beam manager in the, in the creation of the beam execution plan. And the most important task is the creation validation and approval of the different coordination models or discipline models. It depends a little bit if it's a big project with one um, pro, uh, beam coordinator and then different discipline coordinators or only one, uh, only one coordinator. And then the third important beam role, of course, the beam modeler is, uh, is uh, modeling or creating the, the models. Of course, in this definition of the roles, it's uh, going to have some difference or slight differences from, from one country to the other or from one client to the other. So that's why, that's why it's so important that we define in the BIM execution plan what are the roles and what are the duties and the tasks of each of these roles. What we do in, 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 the, in our projects in the BIM execution plans is we define a, a responsibility matrix for each of these uh, of these beam roles, so that it's 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 clear. Another important uh, part of the beam execution plan is the beam process plan. This defines all the all the process of the creation of the um, of the on the of the implementation of beam in the designing in the design part of the project. Another part that we see before in the, in the second presentation are the information requirements. So the information requirements defined by the client in the document employer's information requirements are then specified in the BIM execution plan. And under information requirements, we understand the level of detail that one model or object has to achieve in a specific project phase. Um, on the le then level of detail, we can distinguish between level of information, also information or attributes contained in, uh, in the objects or in the models, and level of geometry, which is the level of graphical representation for each object in a specific uh, project phase. What we see here on the right side is an example of, of a level of detail matrix, a current project, we see on the left side all, all the different models, the different uh, objects or elements that has been modeled, and then all the attributes that we have, or all the information that we have to implement in, in these objects, and then the different um, level of, of detail that we have to achieve in different uh, project phases. And as, as, was, as it was explained in the second and third presentation, um, in the BIM recommendation of TAUP, there are very good uh, examples of, uh, of uh, the definition of LOD, LOG, and LOE for different project uh, for, for different project phases. Another important part of the BIM execution plan are the model requirements. So in the BIM execution plan, we have to define the model structure, the structure of the different discipline models, and how to codify the different objects inside the models and the models. Um, again, I want to refer here to the, um, to the um, BIM recommendation of Taub, and we saw it also in the second presentation with, with this possible codification system for the, um, for the different objects and, and the models. Then the last, important part of a BIM execution plan is the definition of the ICT infrastructure. So here is defined which designer is working with which software, which are the, or what are the exchange formats of these uh, different designers. It is common and it was also mentioned in, in the first presentation that cl clients, um, they are 
now requiring open um, exchange formats. But we have also seen in, in smaller projects where all the designers works with, uh, with the same software that we stay for the exchange of the model on, on, on native format. But uh, the future goes in, in direction of, of, of open exchange, uh, exchange formats. Now I want to talk about the model-based uh, coordination and, um, and collaboration. Under model-based coordination and collaboration, we understand uh, beam model-based coordination between the different designers. So it's not a classical coordination, um, only with 2D drawings and only physical meetings or, or, or exchange via mail. No, here the, the coordination and the collaboration is done on based on a so-called coordination model. Um, for this purpose, it's so important, as I said before, that in the BEAM execution plan, the project structure, the model structure, and the, and the structure of the different discipline models is clearly defined in the BEAM execution plan. On the right side here, we see the, um, the model structure of, a, of an actual project. The, um, the model here was structured or was divided in five discipline models. We had one model for plumbing, we had one model for ventilation, one model for cables and electric equipments, one model for, for the cooling equipments, and one model for the civil and structural works. Every designer, we had also different designers, every designer was working in, in his uh, discipline models. Every two or three weeks, the models were exchanged, a coordination model was created by, by, the, by the BIM coordinator, and then uh, we could check if there were um, any geometrical conflicts or collisions in order to adapt one or the other uh, discipline model. Another important issue of the, um, of the model-based coordination and collaboration is the definition of um, the units that we are going to, to use and other geometrical uh, constraints, for example, as the system, the coordinate system. That's pretty obvious that it's uh, also one aspect that uh, you have to consider in, in a classic project. But again, in when if we are building uh, uh, a tunnel infrastructure first virtually, it's clear that um, that all the designers are working with, with the same basis. So that's why this uh, definition of, of system of units and coordinate system has to be also described in the beam execution plan. On another important topic is also the, the codification of the objects and of the, of the different models. This topic uh, was presented uh, also before and, and in the second presentation. And then the last important uh, point of the model-based coordination and collaboration is the definition of the collaboration systems and the coordination workflows. On the top of this, on, of this uh, slide, we see uh, an example, how was uh, handled this in, in a project. We have uh, the first part where every discipline is uh, doing his, uh, his discipline models, then the discipline models are approved or are checked and approved by the BIM coordinators of each uh, discipline designers. Then the models are, are shared, um, are checked by the BIM coordinator, are published, and then um, we went to the, to the different I sessions or coordination sessions together also with, with the client. I'm going now to the, um, to the next um, topic of the today's presentations. This is the um, model-based quantity takeoff and, and cost estimation. During the different design phases, designers have to provide to the client uh, different cost estimation. These uh, cost estimations normally are delivered after each design stage. So we are doing this job um, more than one time during the, the design phase. 
And the goal will be that we can directly extract the quantities from the beam model, link these to the unit prices, and then create the, um, the cost estimations or directly extract the cost estimations so automatically generate the cost estimations from the, from the bill model. In the next slides, I will show an example of a current project in Switzerland where we um, did uh, a model-based quantity takeoff and, and, and cost estimation. To understand how we did this, um, this cost estimation, I want firstly to, to introduce uh, two topics. In Switzerland, we have the so-called norm position and catalog, NPK or, or CPN. These are standardized uh, bill of quantity items used for the creation of bill of quantities in the tender phase. What we also have in, in Switzerland is this bau cost and plan BKP, that is a cost structure for the phases design and construction, and they are used for the cost estimation in the design phase and for the cost surveying. What the clients uh, require in during the design phase are the cost estimation based on this uh, big KP on this uh, bow cost and plan, or when we are close to the phase uh, tendering or to the construction phase, so in the detail design, they also um, want the cost estimation based on this uh, standardized bill of quantity items, these NPK positions. And that's what we did in, 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 in this, pro in this uh, project. So in the BIM model, to the different op uh, objects, the, um, these uh, NPK positions, were, were defined as, as attributes. Um, the challenge were objects containing different NPK positions. For example, an, an inner lining contained different positions for concrete, formwork, or for enforcement, and uh, with different measuring units. So the challenge was to try to link the right position or yeah, the right position with uh, with uh, the right unit. For that, we created uh, a hand handmade tool that allowed us to, um, to make this linking between the one extracted quantity of the model and with, uh, with, the, with the attribute, or in this case, with the related NPK position. In a further step, what we had was uh, a unit price list linked to the NPK position. And then in a last step, we um, also with another handmade tool, um, we linked the, um, the different extracted quantities linked with the NPK position or this standardized uh, bill of quantity items with the um, unit price list. And at the end, um, a cost estimation was uh, generated for, for the project. As you see um, here, uh, model-based quantity takeoff was directly done from the model. The, the cost estimation, for the cost estimation, we used um, some separate uh, tools, but uh, we think that in the future, these workflows will, will allow that we don't, um, we do everything directly from the model. That's, is uh, what I want to explain with this last uh, slide regarding the, the model-based cost estimation. As I explained before, in Switzerland, we have, we have this uh, cost structure, um, our cost and plan. And they are already working in, a, in an IFC interface between the BIM model and this uh, cost estimate or yeah, cost, cost structure in order that the Cost estimation is done inside um, the model. I'm coming to the last uh, topic of, um, of this first part of the presentation, drawing extraction from the, from the BIM model. As I said before, we are now in a transition phase um, between classical and full BIM uh, design. So the clients are, some clients are still um, requiring 2D drawings. Uh, we designers are partially or totally working already with, uh, with uh, BIM modeling softwares. 
and one of the challenge is to generate from these uh, from these models to the to the drawings according to the standards of the clients. And at this point, what I want to say is that the, the important would be to to define clear and automatized templates in order to optimize this extra extraction process. The big question is when we are going to um, design and build without uh, 2D drawings, then uh, these, these steps would be not any more necessary. I'm coming now to the second uh, part of my presentation, model-based um, tendering. So after the phase design, we have the, the phase tendering and consisting of the creation of the tender documents by the designer together with, or by the client together with the designer, the realization of the offers by the buyers, and then the evaluation of the offers and awarding the works. Um, the, the, the tender documents consist of uh, a draft of, of, the, of the future construction contract, uh, it, it, um, it, it consists also of the technical specification and constraints. We have also the, the part of the, um, of the tendering document is the construction schedule, the bill of quantities, the drawings of the project, and further technical description as the geology, the project, etc. Cetera, et cetera. That's clear. The, um, the tender documents that we have in a project may vary from one country to the other, or may vary also in dependence of the, of the type of contract that we have. Now, the big question is how to link or how to add all this contractual or tendering documentation to the BIM model that we created in, a, in, in the previous phase, so in the phase design, and then how we um, convert this information together with the BIM model in a construction contract and then are do, uh, and then hand over the this um, this model to the to the contractor in this slide we can see on the top which element of the tender documentation could we directly theoretically directly link or insert in the BIM model so it's clear uh, first of all the the construction schedule. Um, some it's possible that already during the design phase it was done. Uh, it was done a 4D simulation, so we already have this uh, the construction schedule inside the the BIM model. As we see before, one part of the bill of quantities is already inside the is already inside the the model. But this is only for building materials, um, formwork, or prefabricated elements um, associated with quantities. Then, of course, the drawings we can extra extract it directly from the model, or they are, or instead of drawings, it, it, uh, it, um, we directly um, put the, the BIM model inside of the tender documentation. And then, a part of the technical description, for example, the geology, is already is could be also already implemented inside of the BIM model. A tender documentation and, and, and uh, a contract consists also of further documents that now is uh, the big question, how we implement this um, documentation inside of the model and we can give the model to the contractor or to the buyers in order to do the offers. And in a specific, that is the, the draft of the contract further technical specifications that are not defined inside the, the, the objects, then a part of the bill of quantities. So every, every item or element of the bill of quantities that, need, that is not related to a building material or a prefab or, or a, a associated quantity like installation, construction equipment, time dependent cost. That's the big question, how to link it with the model and then further technical descriptions. And, on these challenges now of the bottom of, of this slide is where this, uh, the, the task force inside, inside uh, DAUP is working now and is going to do a, a recommendation as we saw in the, in the second presentation. So I come now to the, to the end of my presentation with the, this uh, last slide. 
Um, we saw how we are dealing with beam models in the phase design, how we could deal with beam, beam models in the phase tender and in the, in the, in the tendering phase. And then we are uh, con starting with the construction phase. And then is, uh, it, it happens the, um, the model handover to the contractor. And in this case, um, the contractor or possible applications by the contractor in, in the beginning of the construction phase is use the beam model for the construction site preparation to simulate, to simulate some construction logistics or to do the detailed construction scheduling based on the, cost, on, the, on, the, on the construction schedule from the contract. More of these applications are we going to see it in the last presentation of today. I come to the end in my presentation are also the, the references that I use for doing the, the presentation. I think the presentation will be will be published after the um, after the webinar of today. And I come to the end. Thank you very much. And now I'm obviously open for discussion and and questions. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your nice presentation, Eric. Great. So I want to hand over to Roland, uh, if you have any question from the participants. Yes, uh, we got some questions. Uh, so a lot of compliments uh, for the great presentation. Uh, but the first question is, how do you manage to have as little as possible interface collisions between the different disciplines model? Do you define basic boundaries for each discipline model? So it's a good question. It's an iterative process. Um, I mean, it's not that every it's not that every designer or discipline designer is starting from zero um, to or starting from zero with his own part of, of the project, and then we go all to a coordination meeting, put the models together, and see. Oops. Uh, I didn't knew that you were are, are going to put a wall here or I don't know. Yes, coming back to the questions, when we start with the coordination, before we start with the modeling, we are defining some basic rules, um, normally on the table, also with, with uh, classic 2D drawings and then starting from, from these basic rules, each uh, designer is starting to set up his, uh, his models. And that, that is for, for a very early project phase because normally when we um, are in more advanced design phases, there is already a model and uh, the boundary conditions are already defined from, from this existing model. Okay, uh, Eric, thank you very much. Uh, because of time, uh, I would say, uh, I'll have a question at the end in the discussion round. Uh, I want to uh, hand over to uh, our second presentation. Um, Multidimensional data integration for BIM. Uh, it's a concept for, I think we, we get a concept for mapping different approaches to objects uh, will be presented by Alexandra Massahuma. Um, I think in my opinion, uh, this work is essential assumption for the implementation. Uh, of a presented object catalog in practice. So it's really, really important, this work. And um, I would like uh, to briefly introduce Alexandra Massacuma now. Alexandra Massacuma is a professor for digital transformation in tunneling at the Montan University Leoben uh, at the chair of subsurface, subsurface engineering. She is a computer and data scientist with an additional background in management science. Here, her research topics are information integration, model-driven engineering, and model-based data analytics. She has been leading numerous interdisciplinary research projects in the field of digital transformation. Prior to, a journey, uh, to joining the Montan University, she had been uh, with the Austrian Council for Research and Technology Development where she was responsible for technology policy and the implementation of key enabling technologies in Austria. Alexander, we are very excited about your presentation. The microphone is yours. 
So thank you for this brief introduction to you, Peter Meyer, and also a warm uh, welcome and good afternoon from my side. So hopefully you see now the, the first slide. Um, in this session, um, I will uh, give you a presentation to the topic multidimensional data integration for BEAM. And in the next minute, I will discuss it from a more uh, computer scientist perspective. And uh, so I hope you feel comfortable uh, on this journey. Let's start. So you see now the interoperability as a vision. And hopefully, uh, hopefully, we will uh, uh, come that this uh, vision will come true. So, to put it in a nutshell, a start is uh, to have a uniform and consolidated view uh, of data, a so called common data environment. For this, a homogeneous structure that enables seamless interoperability among all these stakeholders, as you can see here, is needed. And interoperability means to integrate data from multiple and heterogeneous sources for a seamless data exchange in a platform independent system. And integrating is the magic word since it is a precondition for performing interoperability. So the problem is that they either have different formats and receipts in different structures. Perhaps human being can handle this kind of heterogeneities, especially a semantic one. This cannot a machine or better to say a software or an algorithm. Therefore, an appropriate architecture for machine readable data integration is needed. So interoperability in practice, and this is also a question from uh, the last uh, presentation is that there are different concepts, standards, especially tools used in the context of BEAM, and each of them has its own data model. And so communication interfaces like this one are needed. So which are in general, such B2B connections. And this means that per data exchange direction, so as you can imagine, this is one direction, this is another direction, a converter for import and export is needed. And when you see all these two-sided arrows, then you can imagine what does this mean? A combinatorial explosion and a huge maintenance effort, and in general, half to two-thirds of the costs go for maintenance. So here is an example that shows such bilateral solution uh, which produces inconsistency. For example, you have a wall in application A here, exchanged via, for example, the IFC standard, is not necessarily the same wall when it arrives here in application B. So when it kept in application A, the wall is editable because its uh, geometry was parameterized. In application B, it's a polygon soup that can not be edited as a wall, like here. It's only, let's say, an unintelligent mesh. The next thing is that Excel is used as the tool to be for many information related issues. So Excel is used like a, would say, pocket knife um, for uh, model data, for describing semantics, for instance, for properties and property groups. Of course, Excel is easy to handle, but it considers no semantics and it, there is no support for any formalism except the implicit one the expert group agreed on. This means that, for example, in one column, behavior is a property of an object, and in another column, it's a type of an object. And this is what I mean with there is no formalism. Another problem is that Excel is used as a database, and therefore the sheets can get very complex and we would say heavyweighted. So at the end, all the ones who should work with these sheets are getting a headache, especially computer scientists, believe me, who have to implement the data model the sheets represent. So what is needed from our side, we think, is an integrated interface like this one here, as an example, that is a platform independent and has the flexibility to consider heterogeneous and often changing concepts in the BEAM context. What we therefore suggest is a kind of workbench for integration with mapping mechanisms. So the symbols here are for these mapping mechanisms to find correspondences among those concepts as well as to enforce BEAM compliance. The starting point are the employee's information requirements here, with which are contract relevant, as we already heard, and serve as a basis for the BEAM execution plan. 
This means that the requirements placed on any kind of digital model will be defined by these employee information requirements. This applies to the properties and quantities and also the objects to be used in the project as well as to the domain models at the end of each project phase. To be BIM compliant, we use IFC and therefore we separate the properties and the quantities from the structure. Since this is a feature uh, of the IFC in version 4, which allows for great flexibility. And this interface combines all these concepts for a seamless as well as tra a traceable uh, integration within a project. As I said before, we use IFC here in the middle to enforce beam conformity. So uh, I present on this slide, we call it a star architecture where IFC is in the center. Since it is so expensive that it can hold the semantics of different domains. So when we use this kind of architecture, each tool standard and so on can have its own native format with its own semantics, which can be mapped to IFC for further integration purposes. The architecture enables to put the data and their exchange in the foreground and not the different proprietary formats. This means integration without restricting the autonomy of the sources, which is important. So that this uh, doesn't remain as just another conceptual approach, I will show you the interface based on a specific use case of a subsurface model, which is part of the employee's information requirements. There is already a standard known, the ISO 23386, as you can see here at the slide. Um, it describes the attributes of all possible properties and quantities which could be hosted on a property server. This standard is text-based. There are no formal models. It's own, there are only lists with pure textual information. The object templates here can be user-defined IFC model view definitions, for example, that mandate a subset of the IFC specification to be used, such as classes, for example, relationships, and so on. And at the end, we have a subsurface data model uh, as an IFC model to be beam compliant. However, for integration proposed, we need a data schema to structure data instead of having only text-based description in data like here. Um, and there is a standard, uh, the ISO 23387 here, uh, which um, describes uh, the data schema of the underlying ISO 23386. So this model or data engineering from a model or data engineering context, an object is a data object with attributes, like you can see here, interfaces to other objects with cardinalities. Um, and this standard is not only weighted down by redundancies, like for example, here, here you can see, or here. Uh, it's also an attempt at mixing custom constructs with IFC relationship classes. Therefore, we uh, have this mixed with, with colors. And maybe this is one reason why it is not used, why, why it is not in use. And domain expert groups design their own data model or database only on this standard mostly by using Excel. And however, this is the data schema that can be used and should be used because it's the standard for it. So what we have done is we produce formally correct data schema. This, the, therefore, we, uh, sorry, therefore, we adapted uh, the standard model. And uh, as we now you can see here on the left hand side, we have decomposed the model stepwise and build it up uh, only with those relevant classes and relations needed to hold the information as defined in the ISO 23386. And this means we discarded these redundant elements and corrected ambiguous constructs. Our goal was a well-defined correct data model that we can immediately implement and which we also can map what we need for the functionality of the integrated interface to an excerpt of the IFC as needed to find the correspondences. So when you follow the dotted line, you find all the correspondences between these two standards. Regarding our specific use case, on this slide, you see a 3D subsurface model with different classification layers. And one of these layers is a geological classification. 
Since we base this example on the so-called Austrian ÖGG guideline, the terms are in German and not in English, so thank you for your understanding. Uh, what we have done is we have manually transformed the row textual description of the standard in a taxonomy like this here with its interwoven relationships, which are very important, like from the lithology to the geological unit. Therefore, we worked with the domain expert groups of geotechnics, also geologists, in the course of our scientific work and in our work in Daub. What you see on this slide is, and on the following one, are only simple excerpts, uh, which we have selected to better understand the wide ranging approach. Uh, the backbone of each of the presented taxonomies or excerpts of it uh, are data models with, uh, which are quite more complex than this and formally well-defined data schemas. So this is only for simplification. The same we have done for the geotechnic, yeah, that you also have a taxonomy for the geotechnical parts and also for the behavioral one, as you can see here. So from an information integration perspective, there are different aspects to be considered, such as geology, hydrogeology, geotechnical, and also behavioral ones. And beside the information perspective, we are also working on the geometric aspects by considering multi-geometries. And we are also working on a workflow based on Excel that such transformations from text to taxonomy or from Excel to a UML conform model can easily be done automatically. So that is not a burden to the domain expert. This means we have to consider a parallel classification, which we highlighted by using these different colors. So all these different aspects are condensed in a single unit. And let's leave it that way, we will come back to this later on. Coming back to the integrated interface and the introduced star architecture, on this slide, we map a geological unit here with its properties and quantities uh, to IFC in version 4.3 to release candidate 2. So there is an IFC element that can be used in this version, the so-called IFC solid stratum. I would say this is a kind of proxy for the geology. The properties can be mapped to the well-known IFC property set with its single value as well as its complex property values. And there are no other elements that can be used or easily be adapted uh, in the IFC. However, all relationships and dependency can be easily mapped automatically, what is symbolized by this here, um, where we uh, use model transformations. This means there has to be done once manually uh, such a mapping from an expert, and then it can be done in an automated way by formally defined mapping rules. In the next step, when you remember the, the integrated interface, we have a further mapping starting from the IFC to this standard norm, the ISO 23387, the adapted one. And this uh, works really quite easily. The object and properties could be easily mapped from to IFC and then to the other schema. Um, and what we present here is the integration process for producing a unified model as output to bridge the heterogeneity problem among the different schemas. But however, yeah, the typed information already resides here in the, in the domain specific model. So the full semantic is in this model and can only be transferred in a fairly generic container like the solid stratum or this one here called bow object from this standard. And this may cause problems, as we will discuss in the following. So for example, let's consider a project that has, that has two, uh, to conform to two standards, as for instance, in a railway project between two countries, let's say Switzerland and Austria, where a seamless information exchange with semantically harmonized data should work. On the left-hand side, you see the already known ÖGG guideline, and on the right-hand side, the standard of the Swiss Society of Engineers and Architects. We transform both exemplarily in a taxonomy, yeah, as you already uh, said before. The two models look very similar, but differ in structure as well as semantics, since they use 
both different objects and properties, as well as overlapping ones. This means that there are different kinds of heterogeneity between these two standards, structural, semantical, as well as pragmatical. To give you a concrete example, one standard describes the behavior of the subsurface model, where the other discusses the risks. However, both mean nearly the same. So when we map the objects and properties to IFC, like we have done from this side here and from this side, uh, then we have to deal with information loss, different semantics or type definitions held in a simple proxy like the EFC solid stratum. So if at all semantic could only be packed in the name of this proxy, this also will lead to a difficult conformity check of models and only limited traceability. And this means that the introduced star architecture maybe is not an optimal solution for formally correct and fully traceable information integration, since it is too generic. So not only from a semantic point of view, we run into a problem when integrating. Let's have a closer look to the geotechnical classification. And remember at the beginning, this is, uh, these taxonomies are only simplifications. On the left-hand side here, um, the segmentation along the tunnel alignment produces geologically homogeneous segments. Whereas on the right-hand side here, since the primary segmentation criterion is the risk, the segments are not necessarily geologically homogeneous. And it is important also when integrating that such semantic links or internal links made by domain experts like, uh, I, like this one or this one here are also taken into account when integrating. So what could be a good solution? An approach to overcome these obstacles is a stepwise integration, we suggest, based on an initial step done by the domain experts' knowledge. So we shift the first part of the integration to the domain experts. This means that we firstly integrate at the domain level and then in a second step on a higher level of abstraction here to IFC. An approach we also use when integrated data schemas from different tools, like uh, here uh, at the right-hand side. As you all know, interoperability between different data models is a major cornerstone to achieve, for example, for round-trip capabilities. What we therefore need is a kind of generic integration model to define correspondences between, for example, these two standards for a seamless data management. What we want is information preservation, a semantic structure preservation, and a modeling style preservation. So based on our example, what does this mean and how can we handle the parallel classification I already mentioned? Looking at the slide, we have to consider that an object like here is a volumetric unit with different aspects, geology, hydrogeology, geotechnics. So in a geological classification, we have units, which let's say are neighbors yeah, from, from these objects. Uh, so neighbors of other units. So the geometric in combination with the semantic structure may look like this, where we have also these internal links of neighborhood. The same could be done by having the focus on the hydrogeological classification, like here. And of course, the geotechnical one. So when, when we condense these aspects, we will get a picture of an intersection like this one here, both of classification and of geometry, where a unit is the intersection of a geological part, a hydrogeological and a geotechnical one. And for, from a computer scientist perspective, this means that an object has more than a single type. So what does this mean? Uh, we have a focus on the object as a unit, and on the other side, on the layers here, which hold the specific attributes from certain perspectives. And this should be reflected in such a generic integration model and in its structure as well as semantics and how could this work? The domain expert have to define an assignment 
once manually. This is a workload that cannot be done by the computer scientist. The good news is on this side that subsequently everything is generated or better to say integrated automatically. What we do here from a computer scientist perspective is known as a so-called a posteriori typing. And as you can see, without a semantic loss, we would have when only using a star architecture, because you, here you have more elements that are used where the domain expert has the choice which element to use. In a final step, we map the elements from the integration model to the corresponding IFC elements. Of course, this IFC in the version 4.3 as already done before. And as you can see, we will get a better mapping because it encompass an entire domain and not a single standard than when applying the star architecture. And we have a quite better traceability, it's sure on a higher level of abstraction. For example, one could implement a so-called component library, for example, where the domain experts only have to pick and place the elements into the integration model. And thereby, it is possible to make a good use, for example, of the new IFC tunnel elements. Yeah? But the mechanism is the same as before uh, exemplary uh, from the interface integration of the star architecture. Last but not least, this approach also allows to integrate to any other arbitrary standard. We have here, just to name one example, uh, choosing the Bohol ML standard. And um, we would rather preserve the uniqueness of local standards with such an approach. Uh, so this allows a maximum on autonomy. Uh, when we offer such a generic integration layer. Um, yeah, and this is important uh, to enabling the vision of the common data environment. So thank you. And I think the time, so I, I, I had a, a quick speech. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, Alexandra Masakuma for the speed and the time um, right uh, on 25 minutes. Uh, great. It was a great presentation, a lot of information, uh, some of them uh, complex. Uh, hopefully all the participants understand all that different things, but I think it is really, really important uh, for BIM integration in practice to have such a mapping model or, and uh, such a system. Uh, Roland Leuger, is there any question? Uh, yeah, up not to now, um, there's uh, no question, uh, not a question has arrived, uh, but uh, in the meantime, maybe allow me to ask one question from my side. So um, I'm, I'm, an, I'm a civil engineer and, and I'm uh, used to, to have some, some little experience in tunneling, uh, so not, not an IT specialist. Uh, however, I, I had, had some uh, IT experience, but uh, maybe you allow me to ask a stupid question. To what extent has a normal, a quote in, in quotes, a normal engineer to understand this internal database? So is, is it possible just to use it as a tool uh, like, like uh, I can use uh, Word or Excel or uh, does also the, um, yeah, the, the engineer working with the BIM model has to understand a little bit of this uh, internal data flow. Yeah, so the computer scientist had, has to understand it. So for the domain expert, we will it keep as simple as possible. Yeah, this should explain an approach, uh, how, what can be done to, uh, to bring the vision to the ground. So, um, you, so, so to the domain expert, and this is is where we're also working on that it is so that you are comfortable, for example, with Excel, you can use Excel and we do all the work. So uh, we work, uh, for example, now uh, on an Excel that is so formal that when it is filled in by the domain expert, we get automatically such models. We need formally correct models. We need for uh, this uh, schema integration and um, yeah, and that uh, that this can uh, work. Yeah, and uh, you will not see what is to say what what is the working in the background. Yeah, as so, so for you it's not a burden, but uh, the the people uh, who should uh, uh, implement the tools, they of course have to understand this these flows between uh, the the models. 
Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So, so the, 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 what what I what to say is that domain experts get a user interface for it. Yeah. 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 So in the meantime, uh, another question uh, arrived. Uh, how do you deal with uncertainties? A good question. This is what we uh, have to work on. Absolutely. We heard it uh, today many times. And uh, the uncertainty is for us when you get the data, this, uh, the, what I mean is you have a measurement and then you can, normally it's not uh, such a rocket science to say, okay, you have an uncertainty on this data value. Yeah, It's a fairly common situation. We mm -hmm. also worked on in the stationary industry, for example, yeah, that, you, that the values are uh, added with uncertainty and this can be modeled. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh I don't know. Okay. We, we have some questions left, but uh, I do not know if we can allow them now, Peter, Michael. Yeah, or... you can. Okay, one, one, one question more. Uh, one question is, uh, I don't quite understand why one concentrates on an exceptional situation of a tunnel between two countries uh, in braces uh, valid for Brenner Base Tunnel or Telt. I think it's a, a, a fairly common situation and can be defined by a function. Okay. Or by an interval. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, another one uh, is: is a tool available for external researchers? How can one access it? For this now, not not now. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully okay. in the future. Yeah. Now, sorry for it. <laughs> there is no access to a tool, but we are now in a phase where we have students implementing. Uh, so in a module way, yeah, uh, implement uh, parts of it. Yeah. We're working on it at the university, but uh, this, there is no tool available. So I have a question on, on that way. Uh, you told us that uh, IFC, uh, the IFC standard is somewhat uh, in what you want to implement uh, information from mapping. So I understand there is a mapping system outside from IFC. It is possible to integrate it in IFC or you think it is necessary to do it outside from IFC. Yeah, this is uh, normally well known also in model uh, in model engineering um, that uh, we have these mapping rules, like it's uh, mm -hmm. it's so called the model transformations, and that could not be uh, part of the standard. Okay. So I can use IFC or another standard, but the model transformations is could not be a part of the standard. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. So, but we need then a tool to do it in the future. You need the functionality. So model transformations is a functionality. Okay. But I have to do it. In yeah, because you have one. <laughs> and what, what you also, so the point is that you get a user interface that you can uh, do these um, uh, mappings once manually and then that it gets automatically. Of course, uh, you need for this uh, uh, a tool, but uh, this is not uh, something that will be integrated in any standard. It's well known in the computer science to have uh, such transformations, like an ATL transformation, Atlas transformation, for example, you, you could use. Okay. So you show it on, on an example, geological uh, conditions uh, to, to make a mapping, but we need it also in other, uh, in other parts of tunneling. So uh, the development is such to develop uh, a system, a mapping system, uh, and then we can use it in different parts uh, of a BIM development. Yes. Okay. This, I think, is very important. This it should really be open. So this is only an example to present and also what are the problems yeah, in okay. this integration uh, uh, stuff. Okay. So I think, thank you very much for the presentation and the discussion as well. So, and then I want to go to the last uh, presentation. Um, uh, the last presentation will focus on implementation and actual construction projects. Uh, the title is Example for Application of BIM in a Specific Project. The lecture is Wolfgang Fensloff. Uh, first of all, some information about Wolfgang. Uh, Wolfgang studied civil engineering at the Technical University of Munich. Uh, he was a site manager and project director on various tunneling projects until 2005. Uh, at Hochtief, Dividak, and Weiss and Freitag. He was head of estimating department at Bilfinger and Berger and is it for Emplemia now. Uh, 
Uh, he is head of technical services tunneling Germany since 2016 in charge of BIM and tunneling. Wolfgang is member of working group BIM in tunneling of a German branch of World Tunnel Association and is involved in different BIM working groups of a DAUB. Wolfgang, we are looking forward to your presentation. The microphone is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Peter, for your introduction. Yeah, even it's actually snowing, I send a warm welcome to, to everybody out there in the tunneling world from Munich. Um, uh, my name is Wolfgang Fensloff, as already mentioned, and I'm in charge of BIM tasks at Implenia uh, construction company um, with respect to all the tunneling business. We are um, um, in our home market, it's uh, Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, France, and uh, Norway and Sweden and Scandinavia. Uh, approximately six years ago, Amplenia started to dive into the BIM world in the infrastructure business. Of course, our colleagues from the building uh, branch began a little bit earlier. It is a special honor for me now to have the opportunity to show you the possible application of BIM in practice from the contractor's point of view. Initially, please uh, let me point out that uh, my presentation does not refer to one specific project. I would like to take you with me to several projects in order to introduce you a wide range of applications. Most of uh, the presented BIM applications were implemented on our own interest and initiative. Yep. Let us start with some uh, practical annotations to the subject. The first question is how to approach for implementing uh, BIM on a project. Basically, it helps to create a common understanding of the goals you want to achieve with BIM. We heard it already from Eric. In the next step, you are advised to set up various use cases, structuring the particular BIM activities. Beside the model authoring itself, use cases could be the quantity takeoff, model coordination of different discipline models, the class de detection. 4D simulation and so on. But this is also not only from, uh, from the uh, point of the, the engineer or the client, but if we go for BIM in our company, uh, on our own initiative, we have the same procedures as Eric has already presented. And um, so working with BIM becomes easier when certain tools have been developed and are available. The more tools are available, the faster BIM can be implemented and the risk of reverting to traditional ways of working, working is reduced, which is an important effect. Establish a generic project structure, we heard it sometimes, that you can apply to your project. The DAO recommendation published last year gives advice on how to set up such a structure build up your own object catalog continuously and very important, transfer the traditional processes to the new working method with BIM. Those settings and the organization of BIM implementation will be fixed by the project specific BIM execution plan and the modeling guidelines. Train the stuff on the job is the most effective way to get BIM running in a project. Those trained colleagues uh, act as a multiplier for further BIM activities. On the contractor side, we use BIM both in the bidding and in the execution phase process, regardless of whether models are handed over by the client or not. On the contrary, mostly it's better, better for our purposes to set up the models with our own structure, with level of detail, semantics, and so on, to match the relevant use cases. But this must change in future. Once the owner has already developed the project, for example, with Eric together, by the means of BIM during the pre-design phase, it is obviously beneficial to transfer BIM to the execution phase. 
In this case, the client formulates the requirements that must be met when using BIM in the execution phase. According to us, the project on owner will reap the best benefit when he succeeds to involve all project parties as early as possible in the project development process. The contractor can make his contribution, for example, when it comes to construct, construction sequences, which has a major effect on the construction period itself and might influence the design. The structure of the project should be set up under, under consideration of the designated use cases. Quantities of construction parts can only be taken if the parts are modeled separately. It is the same with the 4D simulation. The sequence of various construction parts can only be displayed if they are available in the 3D model and properly linked to activities from the program. The 3D model then shall be handed over by the client, of course, and the model should contain all relevant information from the pre-designed phase. Using generous standards, we already heard about it, uh, this afternoon facilitates the cooperation between the parties involved tremendously. Now um, it's time to see the first examples in the in the practice. We go to to the transforming to the, the transforming uh, the planning into reality. It's a big advantage to support the work planning process by the means of BIM. You are in the position to visualize the the elaborated concepts in the 3D model prior execution. That means virtual, virtual execution prior to real execution. Here we see the Western portal area um, of the Alpvorland tunnel in Germany, which is a part of the new high speed track between Stuttgart and Ulm. The situation shows the point, let me point it out, shows the point here. Uh, where two tunnel tubes are connected, not only on the same height, but, um, but also from different levels. This results in a bifurcation with many varying and complex cross sections. After tunnel excavation, the works for the ceiling reinforcement and concreting, concreting the inner lining has to be done. And we, we are, I want to point out that we are still in the situation that uh, uh, we are in a dead end tunnel, so we have access just from, from the portal side. This short video I want to show you. Shows the result of different studies, figuring out the most effective, it's not running. Oh, yes, it is. Um, different studies figuring out the most effective co construction sequences. We embedded the necessary equipment into the construction sequences. In red, you see scaffolds for reinforcement works, and in yellow, shutter carrier for concrete in the inner lines. We had at this phase still a dynamic situation, what I've mentioned underground. So you had to think thoroughly which item had to be brought into the tunnel first, covering the various stages of the execution. Finally, we did, let's say, a glass, de uh, a glass detection of the logistic means in the tunnel. Um, with a special respect, here we can see it, with a special respect here in blue uh, to the layout of the air contact. Uh, air, air duct, sorry. So again, the motto, virtual execution prior to real execution and then the real execution you can see down here. A further example of planning relates to the reinforcement works at the Slusen project in Stockholm, where an underground bus terminal has to be built. We implemented a model-based routine for the reinforcement handling on site. The mo model was provided by the client. No drawings were handed over. However, models 
are very large and not really structured, matching our construction purposes. But we could use the clients models to generate viewpoints, which are pre uh, the, these viewpoints are predefined visualized locations in the models and workers can use them. They can open, as you can see here in the animation, they can open the desired uh, construction part, select the um, desired casting step, and then can navigate through the uh, rebar sets to be installed. They are, the advantage here is to reveal single rebar layers one after the other, giving a better understanding of the um, uh, assembly stages. Um, each group of steel fixes uses uh, one iPad. And so we have in some 15 iPads on site. And uh, so far, no iPads were, were uh, broken. And um, we arranged the possibility to read the models then offline. And updates will be done um, as soon as the iPad restores internet connections. Okay, uh, it, it's not, it's not um, an, an easy job itself. Uh, there are some challenges and, impl uh, and implementation. We have heard a lot of them already. Just let me highlight some of them. It's uh, for me, or it's very important to create the readiness of using BIM methods by all parties involved. And even in our own com uh, company, we have to convince um, old fashioned colleagues um, to, to use BIM and um, to de derive the advantages uh, out of the BIM met method um, itself. Then um, already Heinz Erbar mentioned uh, the public procurement um, here uh, and the contract law. And uh, also Lars Baum the Erde mentioned that uh, there will be some change if we want to um, implement BIM on, on uh, projects and um, gain the, the relevant and proper collaboration um, BIM method, the BIM methods can uh, uh, give you. Then use the ground model. Uh, it's, it's an own discipline model and it has to be integrated um, into the construction model, uh, especially with the relevant information. Um, some examples and the uh, um, hurdles and obstacles we have to tackle. Um, we have heard uh, just in the in the speech before by Alexandra, and it's some somebody uh, posted it's hard stuff. It's really especially for civil engineers, but um, I'm I'm really impressed every time, uh, and I'm I'm happy to have this expertise on our board. Then uh, let's come to the added value. Uh, uh, important question of using the, the digital tools. Today, I'm focusing on three types of uh, the added value. The first one is the uh, communication and uh, source of information. Um, the key question in my eyes is how to effectively address ideas and information throughout the project development process. If we look, um, sorry, um, if you look here on the on the on this uh, procedures and processes itself in the 2D world, we have one person here on the left, maybe the client or the designer who creates ideas. Um, and um, they have images in their mind how the project uh, should be executed and what should be the result. And then uh, these images um, are being captured into text and calculations and drawings. And um, uh, the, the recepting person um, has to put up uh, those descriptions and uh, drawings. And this person, again, will um, compose its own image about the project in, in his mind. <clears throat> uh, depending on, 
depending on um, from which side you you come to this project uh, what is your your state of knowledge and experience with uh, with all, with that stuff um, um, we find in the individual approaches and uh, this leads certainly to different results um, and even all information here uh, represented by the elephant is available it might not be revealed because um, of the lack of, conf uh, of uh, communication. Visualization helps a lot and information should transfer by the model resulting in single source of information. So if I please avoid the disruption in information flow, we see it here um, in, the, in the picture. Unintended interpretations uh, can be the result and uh, the disclosure of information I have already mentioned. A second um, aspect uh, of the added value is uh, the data management. We heard it several times, implementation of a logic structure is a mandatory requirement for proper da data management. There was already a question from the audience uh, um, in the first part. Um, so there was uh, um, uh, regarding the naming. Uh, so for me, the consistent naming and uh, the strict discipline for usage is crucial, is crucial. The object code is from, from the doubt we can see here uh, is, uh, is designed to match the elements used in the project. There will be always repeating objects in a tunnel project yeah because we have we have long tunnels and uh, you will find always an, um, more and more same objects in the end of our structure we have implemented in the level 13 and 14 two identifiers which should finally be used to clearly identify each single object you, you can see it here for this shoulder um, this shoulder then is has uh, is identified by by a number or block number or a, a tunnel station or something like that so when it comes to data management we need that structure uh, in that structure we capture the data we we are able to filter them we get a lot of um, uh, information and data out of of the tbm um, software so we have to filter them, then we can analyze it. And in the end, we, we visualize the information and uh, so disclose the information itself. And with that, we can provide the data um, survey in a real time for, for quick decisions. In the end, um, you can make the data available then for further processes or methods, um, especially lean construction or for the operational phase. Finally, uh, the last added value I want to point out today is uh, the transparency and collaboration. So it's, it's one of the big, big uh, advantages that the 3D model with the visualization can create a common understanding of the scope of the work for, for each um, person involved in the project. Um, it, it, it gets, it's, a, it's a big, uh, it's a fast uh, access to, to the information and um, to, um, to achieve this, you should try to get all parties, uh, what we have already mentioned, as soon as possible or as early as possible on the table um, regarding then also the, the contract or procurement models um, and please find their collaborative uh, solutions. This is my, my strong call uh, to the tunnel world outside. We have already heard of some models that the ECI contract or the, the integrated uh, project delivering. Um, once the project then uh, runs well, I think all parties will experience their own uh, success um, under, under those uh, conditions. So what we have already mentioned is uh, that uh, the 3D modeling 
gives you a quick access to the scope of work of, of any person who is who, who is new in the project or he, he starts with the project. Um, then the, the discussions and concept or about concepts, the possible optimization, optimizations and variants can be done um, on um, on the three D model itself. It's it's a perfect tool, and visualization helps a lot. Um, you can use it as a support for for any public relations work, work uh, and you can integrate external persons who are not used to inter interpret drawings and descriptions in the way we from the construction side expect them to do so it helps to to get them on board and to to transport the information uh, they need for their decisions we need them again for our construction phases um but, uh, an example for the data management here we jump to norway we have this project some booked sunstad the um, tunnel projects for the high-speed railway track. There we, we have modeled the, the tunnel. And um, then we, we, we use this uh, Gemini Terrain uh, software. And in this 3D, 3D model, we merge um, different data from, from a laser, um, who's, which scanned um, the, uh, the tunnel. And the cross-section we have uh, blasted. Um, then we use the drill log data and uh, combine it with a theoretical blasting profile. And so we try to to analyze um, um, the results of those data and to optimize the drilling pattern um, in order to avoid um, the overbreak. Next example comes from. Uh, Lyon, it's a, it's a metro in Lyon, where the client uh, asked for, um, for an as built model um, regarding the, um, the inner lining of, uh, of the tunnel. And uh, here we see one example on the right side. It's uh, one segment um, of this TBM driven tunnels. And in these segments, there are um, uh, different zones regarding the drilling feasibility um, uh, defined, uh, especially for the fitting out contractors, for example, for the catenary works or for signaling. And so um, we can, um, yeah, give them the information where are the drilling zones um, recommended or, or not, or where is the position of these zones. So um, we took uh, the, the information from the TBM um, uh, using TPC, uh, combined with the guidance system from uh, VMT. We uh, put the data together on an Excel, again, an Excel sheet. And um, out of this Excel sheet, we could uh, uh, take a Dynamo script to visualize then um, the, the final position of the rings, um, even uh, considering any rolling or something like that, um, to give then this information to the following um, contractor. Uh, uh, one further project start from for the data management comes from the Carenza Berg project in Switzerland, where we execute a drill and blast drive. Um, the, this project was particularly selected as a pilot for the digital documentation. So usually uh, the documentation is done uh, with different reports and uh, the information on this reports is redundant even from, from phases prior to contract award. So we could use uh, those information easily if, if they are um, ex uh, available. Um, we see that the redundancy uh, lead them to, or can lead to errors in the data recording. And uh, so we have some inconsistent information flows. That's the reason why we decided uh, to cap the, capture the data digitally with the means of an app. 
and uh, the data are linked to two objects. Once again, objects in the embedded and proper structure. This approach then enables us to combine single information which each other due to our purposes. And we can see that in the, here in the next, on the next slide. Oh, come on. Yeah, so we have, we have created out of these uh, data as a dashboard for the site management and, the, and they easily can filter the, the relevant information by dates or even by uh, complete periods, um, getting out information about the material consumption, about the performances, um, uh, and in the end um, also um, in detailed information about different activities as the mucking or drilling or blasting. So this is, this is a very important uh, thing for us. Um, Tobias Ram mentioned it already to free site management people um, from uh, this documentation work. Now we come to an example regarding transparency and, and collaboration. Okay, I, I, Peter, thanks. Um, so we, here we have, um, we, we are in the tender phase and we have a 2D um, drawings out of the tender documents. Um, you can see uh, here in the middle, um, it's, a, it's a bland view of, of, a, um, of an underground station. And here we have a bland view of the platform level. We have one round shaft in the center and on, on the right and on the left rectangular shafts. Those shafts are linked with uh, two small transition uh, tunnels we can see here. And uh, all three, of course, are linked with the um, uh, uh, station tubes and the station tubes itself, the axis of them are not parallel, but uh, um, but uh, distorted to each other. Uh, it's uh, together uh, with, with this plan view, we have that um, uh, cross section, longitudinal cross section, there we can see again this middle shaft and the, the shafts, uh, rectangular shafts, and here we have the transitions, and of course we have as well a cross section here, and there we see the linking to the tubes from the uh, from the station, but uh, what was missing from the cross sections in our view is um, the part in between where we have uh, to to uh, see how is the transition from round shaft with a vaulted tunnel piece to uh, the rectangular shaft, and this was for us too complicated um, to get this, and so we we modeled. Um, and of our own initiative, we modeled the situation and uh, to get this situation um, yeah, handled. And um, beside um, many unsolved technical issues, um, I would just like to draw your attention here on this side where we have to uh, install the ceiling in the corners um, of the tubes and, and the shafts. So um, please don't understand me, uh, misunderstand me. It, it's, it's not, I'm not ha um, hesitate to face those um, complex geometries, but uh, I think here with the 2D drawing, it was too, yeah, it was not enough to show the, the situation really there for the execution. My final, Example now for transparency and collaboration goes to Berlin. It's uh, the Kabel Diagonale. Uh, there we implemented this uh, project as a pilot project for the BIM application in Germany. Um, with respect to the collaboration of our three disciplines, as the Special Foundation, Civil Engineering, and Tunneling. Um, for this project, we selected 10 use cases out of our pool of uh, many use cases for, the, for our pilot purposes. 
And um, the use case were discussed and agreed with the project management on site, which is very important. Again, there was one question this, uh, in, the, in the first part about the possibility of the application of the proposed DAO structure for a submerged tunnel. And um, as I think as our structure is uh, quite generic, we succeed here in finding a common structure also for the civil engineering and special foundation parts. Um, so we, it's a recommendation and it's a basis and I think you get along with it if you um, uh, adopt it to your project. So we have here the use cases. Um, I just want to highlight one of the use cases. It's the, the planning of the logistics. Um, where we uh, used uh, then the model, and uh, you can see it here. We we, uh, we have to tackle a seven kilometer TBM drive with four shafts, and uh, we plan then the logistics uh, in the launching shaft. We started with a traditional uh, in the traditional way with uh, paper tools, let's say. Then we had some some digital optimization, uh, but in the end. We, we took the 3D model for very quick studies of different situation, how to arrange the logistic in, in this, uh, in this uh, limited uh, space conditions. So I want to um, finalize here my speech and uh, I think uh, uh, I can give you some takeaways. So be encouraged to implement BIM at your next project. It's 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 uh, advantage in any case. Use uh, the the existing expertise you have internal in in your company or in your institution, and uh, use external uh, ex, uh, expertise which is existing. Train your colleagues as a multiplier effect. Define your goals and uh, use the existing standards. Um, for, for facilitate the collaboration. Then think about the logic structures, consider the collaborative contract models here. I think the circle closes referring to Heinz Airbus presentations regarding the strategy at the, at the uh, beginning. Um, so my call is please get on the road and do one step after the other and you will consistently reap one success after the other in your projects. Thank you for your appreciated attention. So thank you very much, Wolfgang, for your great presentation. Um, because of uh, the time, I would say we hand the question over to uh, the discussion and uh, bring all the things together uh, and start it a direct uh, with the discussion. Um, the aim is that we, uh, the most question from the participants, um, short answer uh, to people get a short answer of uh, questions. So there's a lot of things. Um, I think Roland, uh, maybe you start yeah. the first question. So maybe I can, can start uh, just with uh, one or two questions concerning the last presentation because uh, that is uh, still everybody in mind. So one question is, it is, it is already hard to get your own company on board to learn and in, uh, to learn new softwares and change the way of thinking from 2D to 3D, how to get every party on the project involved. So I think that's uh, intended to Wolfgang Fensloff because you said already in your takeaways uh, that you should uh, try to, uh, uh, to to hand over the information also to your colleagues, but um, how, how to get uh, everybody on the project. Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's a basic question itself to, to start with, uh, with the BIM methods. And um, as I mentioned, the best thing is to have uh, one or two um, skilled people starting with, uh, with um, uh, modeling uh, the projects or parts of the projects, then put all together and work with the model itself. The visualization um, will, will uh, yeah, be a big motivation to do more with, with the 3D model if you then come to quantity takeoffs or even if you 
uh, succeed in linking um, the 3D model with the program, you can simulate the cons construction sequences. So you should try to involve and to motivate them uh, by, by doing on the job. One, one additional question, uh, do you see BIM models to be used for the tendering process as opposed to drawings and becoming a legal document? What would your expectation be for model-based delivery to be successful? So that is uh, uh, regarding the, the legal documents or the binding documents for a contract. Yeah, um, as Eric also mentioned already, um, to, to find a way to transfer the information from, from the, uh, uh, let's say, design phase, uh, then through the tender phase to the execution phase. And I think there should be uh, clear uh, in instructions in the, in the modeling guidelines or in the uh, employer's um, information requirement described how are the processes and who is in charge for what and what is the, the, the final guilty uh, model or document. Um, it's, a, it's a difficult process we have to go through uh, in the next years. And, um, but uh, uh, I think uh, it's, it's worth to do that. And uh, we, will, uh, we will get good results by doing it and um, um, analyzing the insights and experiences in, in future. But it has to be defined and everybody of the, the, the project parties should have the, the same understanding of the handling, uh, the, the 3D models and maybe some 2D uh, uh, documents in parallel. Okay. I think uh, the next question would go to Heinz Erbar. Um, here's a question uh, which was uh, already asked before. It will be interesting to compare DAUP approach with the BSI IFC tunnel approach. It seems to be complementary. And maybe also directly the second questions, are you in contact with uh, other international associations? For example, the Belgium AVV. Um, they are already progressed in building an object type library with the same uh, strategy in mind. So what is the interchange uh, to other institutions like BSI or um, Agentschap Wehren and Verkehr from Belgium? So if I start with the last question, I think uh, with our working groups, we are not in a direct uh, relation with, uh, with this, uh, uh, what is it, organization from uh, Belgium. Uh, I don't know if any of my colleagues uh, does so, uh, so they have to say no. But as I mentioned before, uh, this, this is a good occasion, this webinar, that we can uh, make a bigger network and that we get certain input. If there, We don't have to do the things if they, there are certain elements already solved. So the input is highly welcome, I would say. But uh, the second uh, question about uh, building smart, I think uh, we, we will see, as uh, Professor Matzak Hurmer showed, we do everything that we are, uh, that we fulfill the criteria also of IFC. And um, I think it's, it's good that we make this approach. I'm not sure whether IFC will be able to standardize the entire construction in a certain level of detail for the for the total world, I, for the global world, I don't think so. So I think it will be complementary, and and uh, the future will show whether it works or not. And the next, uh, what is very important is that we get um, pilot projects for our approach, and that is it has been shown in the presentations today. Already, some of the documents of the of the DAO were applied in your project. And I think that's the right way. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, I have another question here, uh, which might be directed to Stefan Frodel and Eric Carrera. 
Uh, could you please let me know that developing a ground model for the already excavated section of tunnel by using different software can contribute to the application of BIM in tunneling. So um, the asker is uh, concerning a tunnel which is already excavated and if it is still of use to uh, take the advantages of BIM. Uh. I think that's a, a discussion many this uh, dis question many discussed what is it uh, useful to uh, <clears throat> to model the, the excavation of a tunnel because the excavation is is gone uh, and I don't know exactly what is uh, outside of the, the excavation uh, and it's a, a question what I want to do with the information and with the model. I think uh, if I want to use it to make some um, uh, mass control or for, for um, calculate the masses and uh, then, then it uh, makes it a sense to, to model all the uh, um, break out of the tunnel. But it's a, it's a question of the use case, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I think there's no one one question to the to the object code. Um, if uh, the object code is is a very uh, specific uh, uh, code, and if it's uh, <clears throat> recognized uh, for this uh, classification system, we discuss this also very uh, often and uh, long. Uh, if we can use the classification for the object code. And uh, we think uh, the classification systems are not deep enough for this, what we want to reach with the code. The code we, we generate is it's more an match key or an identifier for each element that we can identify each element in a, in a model or in a project and can, um, yes, can link it by this code. And I think, or we think uh, the classification systems may be uh, use or usable for the same, but uh, it's easier if I have one code and uh, in this code or a match key, I can use to link some objects with information. Yeah, thank you very much. So I think uh, I, I will pick one question out for Eric Carrera. Um, so, there is one question concerning on last minute changes. How can last minute changes in a discipline model, which might be, which might not be picked up by another discipline be avoided? For example, last minute MEP change not picked up by the structural engineer. Well, um, it's a good question. One is theory and afterwards is what happened in the reality. but. What I would propose and what we also do in our projects, the important is to define project freeze. So to define all the discipline uh, designers um, where we are going to freeze the models. And you can do a modification or, or a yeah, modification on the models until this, uh, this uh, time. And afterwards you cannot do um, any more modifications. But that is only theory, as I said before. So the important is if, uh, modifications come after this project freeze that in the regular coordination meetings you talk with the other uh, designer um, and, and define the, the rules how can you trace this um, this um, this change these changes and maybe I don't know insert it as a special issue in your in your beam model so as an, an unsolved issue to be um, solved on the next project phase that could be a, a way that, that we already use, but for the execution phase, I would say um, just to foresee enough uh, boreholes through concrete in your uh, bill of quantities in order to solve uh, one or the other collision with a wall or with a, with a lining. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's one question directly to you um, also on the NPK, NPK codes in the BIM models. So concerning the point you mentioned about the connection of NPK codes in the BIM models, how far you go with the detail of the code, first, second or third level? Yeah, 
So this specific cost estimation was done for a phase uh, 32, so a, a design phase 32 according to, to Swiss code. So first level uh, for some elements or some objects, second level was enough. Mm -hmm. okay. So then I would uh, probably go to some questions uh, to Alexandra Matsakuma. So there's one question. Um, concerning individual actors on the international base. More often the case will be that the individual actors are international embraces for a national project, both the designer and contractor. Accordingly, one would have to focus more on how these internationally composed actors can work together. So, dealing with, with uh, the international actors more than uh, the technical details is maybe the question. Um, yeah, the development of a common workflow is also part uh, of our approach. So we focus on making technical aspects we just discussed transparent to the domain experts and providing a user interface also that is common and familiar to them. So for example, in a simple Excel sheet has already said uh, that is synchronized then uh, with the actual integration uh, routine in the background. Mm -hmm. And maybe uh, one, one uh, additional question to you or maybe also to Stefan Podel and, or, or and any other uh, person on the podium. Um, how can the geological BIM models handle or take into account developments in the building ground? for example, deformations or settlements. The question also arises in the areas of hydrogeology, um, dealing with changes of the water accumulation, etc. And there's a question, a second question, which is uh, very close to that. Um, what is about the challenge to integrate real-time data in the model, especially during the tunneling process for decision-making facing risks on, on order to be re resili more re resilient uh, mm -hmm. during the construction. So um, that is both uh, concerning the changing data on the one hand on deformation and settlement or on the other hand, uh, the real time data uh, yeah, gained by the tunneling itself. So maybe the first part is so I can say the subsurface model can integrate any type of data and provided there is a standard development for it. And this would require the development of, uh, for example, a digital twin we already worked on. And uh, such a twin is also, also needed when integrated runtime data. This was a special field uh, in this uh, Stationary as in the stationary industry, we worked on with the, for example, five axis grip and robot. Uh, this is a digital twin engineering, what you need that you can back propagate the data. So we have uh, to, to make it step by step. So I think <laughs> first there are things. <laughs> so uh, how to say, don't run before you can walk. Yeah. Uh, but this is, of course, uh, we have to integrate it and we have to think about it, how to do this. This has to do with uh, this digital twin engineering. Of course, it's, it's important to, to uh, back propagate this information in the model so that, that they can learn over the time. Yeah. So that they can evolve. Yeah. But I think there's a really, really big issue mm -hmm. uh, because of a dynamic situation in the models. And uh, we have a lot of changes during the project uh, time. And the question is how fast can we change our models uh, and uh, with additional information from geology or from the hydro hydrology or from the construction itself or from the machines. So, and uh, I think this is the next step. Uh, this is not our step, what we have on the table now. Can add a little bit to the real time, using real time data yeah, exactly. in case with, with settlement and stuff. I think there as well, I'm convinced <laughs> that the modeling and the change and it, that's too, takes too much time and, and uh, you better rely on direct system, direct notification systems and alarms. 
that gives you the time. There's a, there is a lot possible. There is a lot of things possible, uh, yeah. but <laughs> uh, the question is, uh, it is um, the right time in our project now for yeah. such things. Yeah. I would like to add something. I think we are not talking about one big uh, BIM model we want to create. All these uh, topics uh, about uh, water in in the, in the ground and the, deform and the influence on the ground deformations, there exist such models, but it's not uh, our topic to integrate everything in a huge uh, model. The information from such a special model has to be integrated in an overall model on in a simpler level, but we don't integrate everything. This will never be possible. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, maybe one, one more question. Um, so that was... Uh, just uh, sent in some minutes, uh, some seconds ago. Our business is contractually characterized by, by a right to change orders. So the right by the client to change orders, uh, which can exercise practically at any time. Um, so is this included or can this be included in the modeling, in the BIM model? So which uh, might be very important to uh, keep track of the project. Anybody feels able to answer to this or? Uh, yes, yes, of course. Um, so the question is how, how we are handling or tackling this issue today. Uh, and so BIM with the 3D model, with the design coordination, all that stuff is, is a tool itself. And the tool is, is just as good as the information are good uh, coming into the, the model. And in my eyes, um, we should get more experienced uh, and get more routine in the modeling so we can use uh, the model to display uh, changes and um, um, alterings in, in, the, in the construction uh, scope. And I think uh, it is possible and it has to be defined who will integrate the change into the model. In most cases, we have discussions and even disputes about who is in charge of this change. So who should take this um, this change into the model or not. And uh, we have to solve those pro problems together with, with our um, collaborative contractual uh, models and um, ways we, we, I think, I, I hope we will have in, in the near future to, to get closer together because the focus in the end should be on the project itself. It should not be the focus on, on that, who, who is in charge of the change and um, who should stand for it. But we should try to get the focus on the project, on the model itself, and then uh, agree on the changes and then that they will be uh, displayed by, by the model to have, again, one single source of information in due time. I think there is a change in mind also necessary. Uh, maybe also the contract models should be a little bit changed that the people more focus on the project issues and not on the contract issues. Uh, I think that maybe BIM can help to do it in that way. And, uh, and then that question is not so important anymore in the future, hopefully. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, that are the most important questions uh, which were asked. Uh, so there, there are still some uh, very detailed questions. Uh, for example, like uh, how is the reinforcement integrated uh, into the BIM model? But uh, probably uh, we can answer such uh, very detailed questions uh, by email because um, I think uh, the time is more or less uh, used up and um, I would hand over to Peter. Yeah, thank you very much, Roland. Uh, there is a, a lot of questions. I was a little bit surprised <laughs> about the amount of questions, but I, I think it's, uh, it's a good result of a presentation. Thank you very much to all uh, uh, our lecturers uh, today.
it was great presentation. I think a lot of information and uh, hopefully we will work in the same speed as in the past, also in the future on that topic. And we get more and more uh, and better results as we have now. Um, yeah, we finished now and I want to hand over to um, Stefan Mauerhofer uh, because he wants to say the last words uh, from ITF uh, today. And thank you. Uh, thank you very much from my side. And uh, now, Stefan, you can take over. Thank you. I think we're coming to the closing remarks and the outlook. Yeah, after this uh, intensive afternoon, uh, we come the end, to the end of this webinar. And I think also the presentation showed uh, very clearly what it takes to regulate the responsibility and these interfaces in uh, underground BIM project. Uh, and this understanding, this is very, very of a great importance. The DAO recommendations form an excellent basis for discussions uh, for every, everyone. The member nations of EUTF will support the DAO, like I mentioned before, in the future also to, for this developing. And we have really to, to make a common understanding of all these topics within Europe that we can follow the aim to have later on a basis or create a European standard. We have all to work very close together and not every country do something. We have really to, to match this, that we have a, a good basis uh, for this future. And UTF tries to coordinate this. Um, and also, if you have some questions, please contact your National Tunneling Association, which in UTF, and so we can also match this together with uh, the DAO work. On behalf of the UTF, I would like to thank uh, the speakers for the excellent and very interesting presentations and DAO for organizing the, today's webinar. I would like uh, also to thank, and I think this is also a big, big applause to everyone who invested many, many, many hours in the working groups for this good work and good results. I think this is a very, very good basis for this. Yeah, over uh, up to 30, 1,300 registrations. I don't know how many are really online now. Over 50 countries uh, shows really what importance these documents have and the great interest and the central importance of this. In case really you have questions and Roland uh, told it, maybe we answer some questions direct, but please, or also if you have channel comments, please uh, use the form. There is a contact form on the DAUB website you can use this and for more information also, or some uh, members of, of some nations, please contact your National Tunneling Association. Then we can make the link and we can also inform you how we proceed uh, with all of this. Yes, I hope you enjoyed this af afternoon and thank you everybody out there for your kind attention. I wish you a nice and I think also we need a little bit of relaxing evening and good luck with your future BIM projects. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>